Hello, my name is Manoj Kesarvani, and I'm an interventional cardiologist here at the UC Davis School of Medicine. I serve as instructor of record for the IMD 420D course. And this team-based learning session that I'm about to review is entitled Stable Anshina Through the Eyes of the Patient. I would like to go from beginning to end, which was not possible during the live session earlier today. I hope also that this team-based learning session can be used as a review for you as a medical student here in this course for your upcoming quiz, your midterm, and final exam. And of course, this can be an important resource for you, similarly step one. I hope that you can go through the questions that are presented in this team-based learning session and be able to answer them appropriately as part of your review. Thank you, now we'll move on. So as you know, there were several important faculty facilitators during the live session. They included Ezra Amsterdam, Kwame Etsina, Dr. James Joy, Dr. Dali Fan, Dr. William Lewis, Dr. Reginald Lowe, Dr. Gopal Namana, Dr. Aaron Schlegel, Dr. Benjamin Stripe, and last but not least, Dr. Jeffrey Southard. As far as the objectives for this case study, we want to be sure to review important content discussed to date, including coronary artery disease, 12 lead ECG interpretation, and basic concepts and stress testing that will appear on the upcoming quiz and midterm. Also, we will emphasize key concepts that will be tested in the Mr. Stanford case assessment, which will focus on stable angina pectoris. Lastly, this case study should illustrate the critical importance of understanding basic pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease in the routine care of patients. Many of the concepts that we emphasize are concepts that I use in everyday practice as an interventional cardiologist. In any case presentation, we begin with a history of present illness. So this, this patient, Mr. Aggie Davis, is a 66-year-old man who presents to the Heart Center, the outpatient cardiology clinic, for further evaluation of chest pain. Several weeks ago, he began to notice rectal sternal pressure provoked by exertion, such as climbing one flight of stairs or mowing his 100-foot lawn. The symptom abates five minutes after ceasing the provoking activity, and he denies symptoms at rest. That's a key part to his history of present illness. He denies symptoms at rest. In terms of the past medical history, it's significant for essential hypertension as well as type 2 diabetes mellitus. In terms of the social history, the patient is a retired accountant and there's no history of tobacco or alcohol use, but the patient does smoke marijuana occasionally to help relieve stress. Of note, the patient is Caucasian. With regard to family history, the patient's father died of a myocardial infarction at age 52. In a first-degree relative that is a male, we know that premature heart disease is defined as having a coronary event before the age of 55. With regard to a first-degree relative that's a woman, we say that premature ischemic heart disease or pre occurs when a patient has a coronary event before the age of 65. This patient, Mr. Aggie Davis, has no known drug allergies, and his medications include metformin and hydrochlorothiazide. Metformin is a very important medication for diabetes treatment that serves as a foundation for that disorder. Hydrochlorothiazide is a thiazide diuretic that's used to treat essential hypertension. Moving on to the physical examination, we'll first examine vital signs. The patient in the heart center was afebrile with a temperature of 37.1 degrees Celsius. In terms of his heart rate or pulse, the patient had a heart rate of 97 beats per minute, which does fall in the range of normal between 60 to 100 beats per minute, but you will acknowledge and admit that it is on the faster side, although it's within normal limits. In terms of the blood, patient's blood pressure, the patient's blood pressure is elevated at 162 over 95 millimeters of mercury. 
In a patient that has known cardiovascular disease, we state that the blood pressure goal, according to the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guidelines, is a blood pressure goal less than 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury. In a patient that has no known cardiovascular disease, we state that the blood pressure goal is less than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. So regardless of which goal you choose, this patient is notably in the hypertensive range, and this range would be consistent with stage 2 hypertension. In terms of respirations, the patient is not tachypneic. The patient is breathing at 14 breaths per minute. The patient also has a normal oxygen saturation of 98% on room air by pulse oximetry. In regard to the body mass index, the patient's body mass index is 29 kilograms per meter squared. This puts this patient in the overweight category. A BMI between 25 to 30 is consistent with overweight status. A BMI of 30 or greater is consistent with obesity. In general, the patient is in no acute distress. In particular, he's not in any cardiac distress. He's alert and oriented to person, place, time, and situation, and is able to have a normal conversation with a physician. In terms of the head, eye, ears, and neck exam, the patient has no arcus cornealis bilaterally. This refers to a light ring around the iris that represents lipid deposits. This would be of concern in a patient that has this finding that's less than 45 years of age. It would suggest a diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia as you have learned in your biochemistry course, I hope. Additionally, the patient has no carotid bruise with normal carotid upstroke bilaterally, suggesting the patient does not have carotid artery disease, but physical exam alone is not the best screening test. The patient also has no jugular venous ascension with a jugular venous pressure of 6 centimeters of water, again falling in the range of normal. On cardiovascular exam, the patient has a regular rate and rhythm. There is a normal S1 and S2 with physiologic splitting, something that you should think about, but physiologic splitting is known to be normal. And the patient has no murmurs, rubs, or clicks. However, the patient does have an S4 gallop. We'll talk about shortly what an S4 gallop represents. On lung exam, the patient is clear to auscultation bilaterally with no wheezes, rails, or ronchi. Additionally, the patient has a normal inspiratory to expiratory ratio. In a patient that has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, perhaps due to long-term tobacco use, a patient can have a prolonged expiratory phase. With regard to the abdominal exam, it is soft and symmetric with no tenderness to palpation and normal bowel sounds. There are no abdominal bruises suggesting chronic mesenteric ischemia or renovascular hypertension or renal artery stenosis in particular. And lastly, there's no hepatosplenomegaly or masses. Extremities. First and foremost, there's no clubbing, cyanosis, or lower extremity edema. Additionally, there are normal bilateral Achilles tendons without thickening. What we're referring to here is a concept of tendon xanthomas. Tendon xanthomas at any age, most commonly in the Achilles tendon and finger extensor tendons, but possibly in the patellar and or triceps tendons, occur because of detectable nodularity. So basically a tendon xanthoma refers to a detectable nodularity or areas of thickening of the tendons that are specifically due to infiltration of lipoladen histiocytes. As you know from your histology course, that's macrophages in the connective tissue, and they're lipoladen. And that can also be associated with familial hypercholesterolemia when it's detected at any age. In terms of the vascular exam, as it relates to extremities, the patient has two plus bilateral radial, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibial pulses as well. Grossly, the patient has no neurologic focal deficits. In terms of the skin exam, the patient has no tuberous xanthomas or xanthelesma. Tuberous xanthomas are firm, painless, red-yellow nodules. They usually develop in pressure areas such as extensor surfaces of the knees, elbows, and buttocks. 
So shown in this example are tuberous xanthomas adjacent to the elbow. In contrast, xanthalesmas refer to sharply demarcated yellowish deposit of cholesterol underneath the skin that are frequently seen in the eyelid region. So given physical exam that we've now reviewed for this patient, the clinical decision making becomes important. So the question I ask you is, what features on physical exam in this patient might suggest myocardial ischemia? So because obviously this is a recorded lecture, I would ask you to pause the video at this point to think about the answer to this question. In particular, you're going to focus on the S4 gallop and think about what that represents. So now that you have paused the video and come back to it, let's now talk about the answer to this question. So in a patient that's having chest pain, we have to consider the possibility of myocardial ischemia. So at a very simplistic level, what myocardial ischemia refers to is inadequate blood supply, a coronary blood supply in particular, to the ventricular myocyte. So if the ventricular myocyte does not have adequate blood supply, what will happen is that there will be a decrease in contractile function, referred to as a decrease in systolic function. So when we have a decrease in systolic function, in particular, with a muscle or ventricular myocyte that's not getting adequate blood supply while other parts of the heart are getting adequate blood supply, what can happen is we can have an uncoordinated or dyskinetic apex beat involving a larger area than normal. Again, we refer to that as a dyskinetic apical impulse. So that's one thing that can be detected on exam. This was not reporting this patient, but the patient did not have a dyskinetic apical impulse. Another thing that goes along with decreased contractile function or decreased systolic function is the fact that the patient can develop pulmonary congestion. So when we're talking about the level of the left ventricle, as we'll learn more about in the heart failure lectures that you will receive in the subsequent weeks, what can happen is that left ventricular end diastolic pressure will increase. Because of the increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure, there'll be an increase in pressure in chambers that precede it. So the left atrial pressure will also increase. And with the increase in left atrial pressure, there'll also be an increase in pulmonary venous pressure and ultimately an increase in pulmonary arterial pressure, such that the patient will have crackles or rails on exam. And that has to do with the fact that with pulmonary congestion, there's actually fluid in the alveoli that are appreciated on auscultation. Now, what else can myocardial ischemia do? It can decrease diastolic compliance. So there can be a decrease in diastolic compliance that can trigger an S4 gallop. So an S4 gallop occurs right before S1. The typical scenario in which we hear S4 is we have a thickened left ventricle, typically related to chronic hypertension, which very well can be the case in this patient because the patient's blood pressure was elevated. And when we have atrial contraction against a thickened left ventricle, it can produce an S4 gallop, which again occurs right before S1. And this is related to the fact that myocardial ischemia causes a decrease in diastolic compliance. Another key feature with myocardial ischemia is the fact that we have papillary muscles that are important components of the mitral valve apparatus as well as the tricuspid valve apparatus. And so when we have decreased coronary blood supply to the papillary muscle, that can be associated with dysfunction. And when we have papillary muscle dysfunction, in particular involving the mitral valve, a patient can develop mitral regurgitation or leakage of the mitral valve. So when the mitral valve should be closed and blood should be going out from the left ventricle or into the left ventricle, that blood is actually going back into the left atrium. In addition, whenever a patient has chest pain, that drives sympathetic tone upward, it increases. And we have an increase in sympathetic tone, we notice diaphoresis, an increase in heart rate, and also an increase in blood pressure. When we focus on an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, what is happening is that we're having an increase in myocardial oxygen consumption, which can be represented by the abbreviation of MVO2. So an increase in sympathetic tone can cause an increase in heart rate and blood pressure that increases myocardial oxygen consumption. Obviously, with activation of the sympathetic nervous system, we can also have diaphoresis. So some more clinical decision-making. 
based on the history and physical examination, develop a differential diagnosis. So again, now is a good time to pause the video and to spend probably five to 10 minutes to really think about a differential diagnosis for this patient, where you're gonna think about the possibilities for why the patient's having chest discomfort in terms of various systems. Of course, this is a cardiovascular system course, and you should begin with a cardiovascular system, thinking perhaps about coronary artery disease and subtypes of coronary artery disease. But also do not forget about thinking about the gastrointestinal system, the pulmonary system, the infectious system, and other parts of the body that might be a potential trigger or cause for this patient's chest pain. So again, please pause the video and spend about five to 10 minutes to think to, about the answer to this question. So moving on now and talking about the answer to this question in terms of a differential diagnosis, first and foremost, we wanna think about coronary artery disease. This patient may very well have stable angina. Stable angina pectoris, the term that was used in the lecture by Ezra Amsterdam, refers to a typical pattern of chest pain in which patients will have a chest discomfort that occurs with exertion, but it's relieved by stress. There's no recent increase in terms of intensity, frequency, and duration, but we'll talk about this shortly. This should be differentiated from acute coronary syndromes, which you'll learn more about in your acute coronary syndromes lecture that we'll provide to you in the coming days. When we think about an acute coronary syndrome, there's a spectrum that ranges from unstable angina to non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction to ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, where you have a complete occlusion of a epicardial coronary vessel, such as a left anterior descending artery. Other considerations for a patient like this do include prismentals or vasospastic angina. What this refers to is that in an epicardial coronary vessel, you can have vasoconstriction taking place. This frequently happens in the setting of a non-obstructive lesion, perhaps a stenosis of 30%, but certainly there's no reason why it can't happen in a patient that has a high-grade stenosis of 70% or greater. But this also can occur in patients that have no obstructive coronary arteries or no significant coronary artery disease, and it's also a consideration in a patient like this. So let's explore all of this in greater detail. Let's first begin with stable angina and review this disease that you learned about through Dr. Ezra Amsterdam. So stable angina is a chronic pattern of transient angina pectoris. It's precipitated by physical activity or even emotional upset or emotional stress. It's typically relieved by rest within a few minutes, and episodes are often associated with temporary depression of the ST segment, but permanent myocardial damage does not result. So it's really important to understand that permanent myocardial damage does not result. And one way that we might be able to assess that is to check cardiac biomarkers. Some examples of cardiac biomarkers that are clinically relevant include high sense of cardiac troponin T. Now, in stable angina, there's no recent increase in terms of intensity, frequency, or duration or symptoms. These are important questions to ascertain when determining whether a patient truly does have stable angina, such as the situation of Mr. Aggie Davis. Now, this is in contrast to unstable angina. So, unstable angina represents an acute coronary syndrome. And acute coronary syndromes are a spectrum of disease, ranging again from unstable angina to non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction to the worst case scenario, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. So what's occurring here is that patients will typically have plaque rupture or erosion. So let's focus a little bit more on this slide here to define what unstable angina is at the pathophysiologic level. So the way that a plaque develops is that we have LDL, low density lipoprotein, circulating through the, the blood system. And what happens is the LDL becomes oxidized and is taken up by macrophages as well as smooth muscle cells within a coronary vessel. And this helps to disrupt the intimal layer such that the plaque develops and it causes a stenosis. So what happens in unstable angina, which differentiates it from stable angina, is the plaque becomes unstable. 
the way in which a plaque becomes unstable is by two major mechanisms. Either it's plaque rupture, which occurs more commonly, or plaque erosion. Plaque erosion is something that we might find more frequently in women. And so when we have plaque rupture, what happens is that there's platelet aggregation, thrombus formation, and also unopposed vasoconstriction. And that's been shown here, where we have atherosclerosis with blood clot. So sometimes we'll refer to this as coronary atherothrombosis. Now, let's talk about variant angina. So variant angina is a disease entity in which there may be no overt plaque, but there can be intense vasospasm, which can behave like a 70% stenosis and cause chest pain. Oftentimes when patients have Prince mantles or vasospastic angina, it can be triggered by cold weather. That's just one example. Now let's go back and talk about stable angina, what is occurring at the pathophysiologic level. The way we can do that is let's first concentrate on a normal coronary artery. In a normal coronary artery, we have an intimal layer that's, that's lined, I should say, lined by endothelial cells. And then we have a medial layer that's composed of smooth muscle cells. So what's important here is that we have a patent lumen, we have normal endothelial function, and there's no platelet aggregation taking place. Now in stable angina, we can develop a plaque in the same way that you developed it with unstable angina, where again, we have oxidized LDL being taken up by macrophages and also by smooth muscle cells. Foam cells then develop. Foam cells then develop. And that's also true of unstable angina. But anyways, we have a plaque here that has, that has not undergone plaque rupture or erosion. And this plaque morphology is chronic, and that's why a patient will have no recent change in terms of intensity, frequency, or duration of their symptoms. Again, we'll talk more about acute coronary syndrome, such as unstable angina, in your cor acute coronary syndrome lecture. One last thing I will say, though, before I move on, is this concept of myocardial infarction. So we talked about non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction, whether it's an end semi or STEMI in the way that I've just described, refers to a region of myocardial necrosis usually caused by prolonged cessation of blood supply. So myocardial necrosis distinguishes patients from unstable angina and even stable angina. Myocardial necrosis has taken place with a non-SC segment elevation myocardial infarction or SC segment elevation myocardial infarction, and that's why myocardial infarction is referred to as part of those names or those entities. Myocardial necrosis has taken place. Now let's go back to this list for the differential diagnosis and talk a little bit about coronary microvascular disease. We talked about how the coronary circulation is divided into two compartments. We have the epicardial or conductance vessels, and then we have the pre-arterials and arterioles which control the resistance, the resistance vessels. So atherosclerosis develops in the epicardial vessels. But we can also have smooth muscle cell proliferation within the pre-arterials and arterioles that can mimic atherosclerosis such that patients can have chest discomfort. This is not something that's emphasized in this course, but it's something we want you to be aware of. So that's a possibility in a patient like Mr. Aggie Davis. And another concept that we don't want to emphasize, but we want you to be aware of, is the idea of a myocardial bridge. So we talked about with epicardial coronary vessels, how coronary flow is, or supply is occurring primarily during diastole. So if we take the example of the left anterior descending coronary artery, the left anterior descending coronary artery is coursing along the interventricular groove as an epicardial vessel initially, but soon it will provide septal perforator branches and will need to course within the myocardium. So if it's coursing within the myocardium, what can happen is that with systolic compression, or systolic contraction I should say, there can be systolic compression. So with a systolic contraction, there can be systolic compression of the vessel. Although the coronary vessel primarily is filled during diastole, this may still result in myocardial ischemia. So you want to consider that as a potential possibility. Again, a disease entity that we are not going to emphasize much in this course, but something we want you to be aware of. And then there's a possibility of anomalous coronary vessels. 
specifically if the coronary vessel takes an intraarterial course. What I mean by that is that, for example, the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery arises from the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve and supplies the inferior wall of the left ventricle. And so what can happen when a right coronary artery has an anomalous takeoff from the left coronary cusp, so again, arising from the left coronary cusp, which is anomalous, it will need to get to the inferior wall. The way it will do that is that sometimes, one of the ways it can get there is it has to take an intraarterial course. So it's a course in between the aorta and pulmonary artery. And because it courses in between with exercise, there can be compression of this vessel as it courses towards the inferior wall. And this might be an explanation for chest pain, particularly in younger patients. Another possibility are inflammatory processes. This includes myopericarditis. So as you'll learn in subsequent lectures, patients can develop inflammation of the serous pericardium, which is composed of the visceral and parietal layers, as we talked about in your first lecture. But this inflammation can also spread or involve the ventricular myocytes, the myocardium. And in that case, we'll refer to, the, we'll refer to this as myopericarditis and not just pericarditis. In addition, there can be inflammation of the pleural space, referred to as pleuritis or pleurisy. When a patient has pericarditis or pleuritis or pleurisy, they may have a friction rub that can be also stated by a stethoscope. Let's move on now and talk about the gastrointestinal system. So one possibility is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Gastroesophageal reflux disease is often described as a retrosternal heartburn, commonly postprandial, so occurring after eating, worse when supine, and thus occurs early in the night. Pain is precipitated by certain foods, especially alcohol and caffeinated products, and relieved by antacids. So that's something to think about. But the fact that gastroesophageal reflux disease is associated with food and particular types of food should allow one to be able to distinguish it from coronary artery disease, for example, as a cause of chest pain. Another possibility is esophageal spasm and other motility issues. So esophageal spasm is also a retrosternal pain accompanied by dysphagia and precipitated by meals. It is not associated with exertion, just like GERD is not, but it may be relieved by nitroglycerin. This introduces a very important point that the response of chest pain or the patient's response to nitroglycerin in regards to chest pain does not suggest the diagnosis because of the fact that patients can have esophageal spasm that responds to nitroglycerin as well. And certainly peptic ulcer disease is a possibility. Now moving on, we have to consider the pulmonary system. So sometimes patients can have an atypical pneumonia. For example, patients can have a mycoplasma pneumonia or a walking pneumonia where symptoms can be very similar to what Mr. Aggie Davis is experiencing. Another diagnosis to consider that we cannot miss is a pulmonary embolism because this can be fatal if the diagnosis is not met or made promptly. Another possibility is a pneumothorax. Typically, patients will develop with acute onset of symptoms, and so it's important to distinguish pulmonary embolism and pneumothorax from a patient having an acute coronary syndrome due to unstable angina, for example. Another possibility, or another system rather, is a musculoskeletal system. And under this category, we have to think about costochondritis. Costochondritis is a focal persistent pain that is worse with movement and reproducible on palpation. So perhaps in Mr. Aggie Davis, although he reports chest discomfort with activity, it may be that he's actually having chest discomfort because of movement. And then infectious possibilities. So herpes zoster is definitely a possibility in a patient like this. Typically, the patient will report chest discomfort not at the time that they have the rash, but as the rash resolves. Another point I want to come back to in regards to the gastrointestinal system is the fact that in terms of patients that have true outright coronary artery disease, one thing to remember is that when a patient does have coronary artery disease, if they do eat a meal, what happens when we eat a meal is there's plankton vasodilation. So they're shunting a blood away from other systems towards the plankton circulation. And the reason why this is important is that if a patient has 
have 70% stenosis related to a coronary artery and you're having shunting of blood to the splenic circulation, you are, you are in effect having coronary steel. You're taking blood or coronary blood flow away from that 70% stenosis. So patients can have chest discomfort related to coronary artery disease that comes from eating. So we do have to be mindful of that possibility. And it just shows how some of these rules about eating being associated with the chest discomfort are not hard and fast rules that we must abide by at all times. Moving on now, this is a 12 lead electrocardiogram for Mr. Aggie Davis. I'd like for you to take a moment here to please interpret this electrocardiogram. When you interpret this electrocardiogram, I want you to remember the mantra that we've emphasized in this course. I'd like for you to begin by thinking about the rhythm. After we think about the rhythm, we also want to consider the heart rate. Then we move on and think about intervals. The three intervals we look at are the PR interval, the QRS duration, and then the QT or QT corrected interval. So these are the three intervals that we're paying attention to. The next big part of this is a mean QRS axis. We want to determine what the mean QRS axis is. And this is a drawing here to help you with it. In this drawing, we've shown where lead one is located, where lead two is located, where lead three is located, as well as AVR, AVL, and AVF. And by using all this information together and thinking about vector analysis, we can determine the direction of the mean QRS axis. Now we also want to consider chamber enlargement. In this course, we really want to emphasize right or left atrial enlargement. We want you to be able to recognize that. Additionally, we want you to be able to recognize left ventricular hypertrophy. We're not emphasizing right ventricular hypertrophy, but as a cardiologist, it's a consideration whenever I look at EKG whether a patient does have right ventricular hypertrophy. And of course, we want to see if a patient has Q waves as a negative deflection after a P wave, because that can be representative of a myocardial infarction. And of course, we're going to pay attention to the ST segments, and we're also going to evaluate to see if a patient has any T wave abnormalities. And whenever we're taking care of a real patient, we're going to think about whether the patient has a prior EKG available so we can compare the current EKG to the prior one to see if there are any interval changes. So we're going to go back now to that EKG. And I'd like for you to follow this mantra and go through it and see what you come up with. And so now would be a good time to pause the video to really think about this and then to unpause the video when you're ready. I would take probably five to 10 minutes to review this EKG in detail, and then we'll go through this EKG as well. So I take it now that you've unpaused the video, we'll go through this EKG. So whenever I look at a 12 lead electrocardiogram, I really begin with the rhythm strip. So in this case, it's lead two that's shown here at the bottom. And so what I'm looking for first when I'm looking at an EKG like this is I'm looking to see that there's a P wave associated with the QRS. So here's a P wave and I wanna make sure that it's associated with the QRS. And I'm gonna look at all the P waves on this rhythm strip and make sure that every P wave is associated with the QRS and that's in fact the case. Similarly, I'm gonna look and make sure that every QRS complex is associated with the P wave. And when I do that, I'm very confident that I see QRS axes associated with every P wave. So I definitely see that. So then I'm starting to think this patient has a sinus rhythm, but we need to explore that in a little bit more detail. So another thing that I look for is I look to make sure that the P waves are upright in the inferior leads. Excuse me, this is not a P wave. Here's a P wave. So I'm looking at the P waves and the inferior leads and make sure they're upright. So then now I'm really to think, thinking about this is normal sinus rhythm. But the other consideration to think about is a, is a heart rate. So we talk about rhythm where we think it's, it's normal sinus rhythm, but this could be sinus tachycardia if the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute, or it could be sinus bradycardia if it's less than 60 beats per minute. So I'm not 100% convinced yet 
This is normal sinus rhythm. So now we're going to focus on the rate. So when we look here at the rhythm strip, what we can do is we can remember with any rhythm strip that the rhythm strip is 10 seconds in duration. So what we can do here is we can count the number of QRS complexes. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And because this is, again, a 10-second strip and we want to know the rate over one minute, we can multiply by that six, by 6. And so we get 66 beats per minute. So that's one way to get the heart rate. Now, another way of doing this is to look and find a QRS that falls on a dark red line, which it does here. And what we're going to do here now is we're going to do the countdown method. So here, 300, 150, 100, 75, and this is 60. So the heart rate is between 75 to 60, and we already talked about that prior technique, and so we know the rate is 66 beats per minute. So now, because I know the heart rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute, I can confidently say this is normal sinus rhythm. Now the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to think about intervals. So when I'm looking at intervals, I'm sort of focusing on the left side of the EKG. So I'm focusing on this side of the EKG, and we certainly will move on to the right side of the EKG momentarily, but we're going to focus on the left side of the EKG. So we're going to look at the PR interval. So the PR interval, when we look at lead 2, for example, is from the onset of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS, and that's a PR interval. And so if the PR interval is greater than 200 milliseconds, then that is going to make us think that the PR interval is prolonged. And we use the term first degree AV block in that scenario. And here it's less than 200 milliseconds, so we feel comfortable. Now a short PR interval is said to be less than 120 milliseconds, and that's not something that we really emphasize in this course. It's more important to recognize when the PR interval is prolonged. And again, we say when it's greater than 200 milliseconds, it is prolonged. Now, the next interval we're going to look at is a QRS duration. So certainly we're focused on the left side of the EKG, but we don't want to ignore the right side of the EKG. And sometimes we'll find that the QRS will look wider on the right side of the EKG. So we want to make sure that we're looking at both the left and right side of the EKG. And for the most part, the QRS duration is consistent no matter what lead you look at and it's less than 120 milliseconds. When it's less than 120 milliseconds, it's normal. So we now know the PR interval is normal and the QRS duration is normal. Now the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the QT interval. Now you learn in Dr. Venegopal's lecture that when we calculate the QT interval, we're going to do a simple calculation and then we're going to get the QT corrected interval. And so a simple and dirty rule to remember is that the heart rate is 60 beats per minute. If we find that the QT interval is greater than 50% of the RR interval, that raises concern that the QT interval is prolonged. Now, as far as giving you numbers for where you should think about the QT corrected being prolonged, I'm hesitant to do that um, because there's a wide range depending on your source. But I would definitely say if the QT corrected interval is greater than 500 milliseconds, that is certainly prolonged. But getting to that point, here's the RR interval extending here, shown here. And if, again, the QT interval, which is here, is greater than 50% of the RR interval, that raises concern that the QT correct interval is prolonged when we're at a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. So the QT correct interval is also normal. Now we're going to move on here and go on to the mean QRS axis. So now when we're thinking about the mean QRS axis, we want to look at lead 1. And here in lead 1, what we find is the mean QRS axis is positive it's positive, it's pointed upward. There's no doubt about that. Then we also want to look at leads 2, 3, and AVF, but we really want to pay attention to lead 2 in particular. When we look at all three leads, leads 2, 3, and AVF, you will agree that it's upright in all of them, the QRS. You can see that here, that it's upright. Now, if we go back to this figure here, and we're looking to see where the mean QRS axis is, what we can say here, thinking about the EKG, is that it's positive in lead 1. So we know that the mean QRS vector is pointing in this direction. It's pointing towards lead 1. We know that it's somewhere on the right side here. And so I'm, I'm coloring all that in. So we know it's somewhere on the right side because it's positive in lead 1. Now, 
What we also notice is that it's positive in lead two. So we know it's to the right because it's positive in lead one. And if it's positive in lead two, then it's gotta, it's gotta be pointing downward here. And it can't be in this area. So although I initially had colored all of this here on, on this side, we know that we can exclude this area because it's positive in lead two. So we know that the mean cross vector is somewhere in this area. It's in the blue, which is normal. So that's how we think about mean QRS axis. Now, let's move on here and talk about chamber enlargement. So when we're looking at chamber enlargement, we really focus on Li 2. So in Li 2, we're looking at the amplitude of the P wave when we're thinking about right atrial enlargement. Now, the P wave amplitude is greater than two and a half small boxes tall. That's consistent with right atrial enlargement. That's consistent with right atrial enlargement. Now, what you find in lead V1, that's where we focus in terms of left atrial enlargement. Now, this is where we're moving from the left side of the EKG to the right side of the EKG. And so, when we talk about left atrial enlargement, what we notice in lead V1 is the P wave is biphasic. It's biphasic because there's a right atrial contribution and there's a left atrial contribution. And here, we're really focused on the left atrial contribution here. And what we find here is that when we have this biphasic P wave, if the left atrial component here is greater than one small box tall and greater than a small box wide, that's consistent with left atrial enlargement. That's consistent with left atrial enlargement. So on this patient, you barely see a negative deflection in lead V1. Here's another beat to look at. And so we know this patient does not have right atrial or left atrial enlargement. Now we'll talk more about this in the EKG workshop that there's a phenomenon known as M mitrali. M mitrali refers to the fact that in lead two, when we have left atrial enlargement, what can happen is that the P wave can look like an M. And that's where the term M mitrali comes from. Now, if the P wave is greater than 120 milliseconds, and you have that M morphology, then we are concerned about the fact that the patient has left atrial enlargement. Now, you don't have to have both M mitrali and the uh, small box, small, the negative function of the uh, P wave in lead V1B greater than one box tall and one small wide to make the diagnosis. You can, it just needs to meet one of the, one of the two criteria in order to call patients having left atrial enlargement. Now, let's talk about left ventricular hypertrophy. So I won't go into too much detail about this because this will really be emphasized in your EKG workshop, but one criteria we want you to be aware of is that we want to look at leads V1 or V5 or V6. So what we're looking for here is we're looking to see that the S wave in V1 plus the R wave in V5 or V6 is greater than 35 millimeters in a patient that's at least greater than 40 years of age. We know that when we have younger patients that they frequently have increased voltage on their EKG. So that for the purposes of this course, we want you to be able to find left ventricular hypertrophy by the fact that the S wave in V1 plus the R wave in V5 or V6 is greater than 35 millimeters. If we see that, we define the patient as having left ventricular hypertrophy. We talked earlier how we don't want to emphasize right ventricular hypertrophy in this course, so I don't want you to worry about that, at least at this point. And then now we're going to move on and think about Q waves. So a Q wave is a negative deflection after a P wave. So we're going to go systematically and look at every lead to see if we see any evidence of a Q wave. And now maybe in lead two, you see a tiny deflection after, after the P wave in lead 2C. You can see that really small and even to some degree in lead 3. Now these are non-pathologic Q waves. These are non-pathologic Q waves. We say a pathologic Q wave is generally greater than one small, one small box wide and greater than 25% the total QRS amplitude. And so those Q waves we see are non-pathologic Q waves. And so we're going to go on, and as we go on, we really don't see any negative deflections after P waves. So we do not see any pathologic Q waves. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at each 
lead to see if there's any ST segment deviation or if there are any T wave abnormalities. And when we do that, we do not see any major SC segment depressions or elevations. Now, when we look for T wave abnormalities, you'll notice, particularly in lead three, that there are T wave inversions here. Now, in lead three, having a T wave inversion in this location is not pathologic. It's a normal finding, it's a normal variant. So, this EKG so far is consistent with being a normal EKG. Now, a couple questions that were raised by some of your colleagues is, what's going on in lead V2? So there's some concern that maybe the T wave here is peeped. Well, you'll notice that we only see it in lead V2. Now, for a T wave to truly be called peak, we like to see that the base is more narrow than this. This base is, is wide. When we see a peak T wave with a narrow base, it makes us concerned about the possibility of hyperkalemia. Typically, we, won't, we will not see that in just one lead. We'll see that in more leads than just one. So that's one thing to remember. Now, another thing to remember is that when we do have um, T waves with a narrow base that are tall in amplitude, that it can raise a possibility, raise concern for myocardial infarction. We know that we can have what are called hyperacute T waves. So T waves that are, are narrow with a high amplitude that can precede ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or ST segment elevation associated with ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. But what you'll learn about in the EKG ACS lecture that Dr. Venigo Paul will provide to you in the coming days is that for us to be concerned about something like that is that we need to see it in two or more contiguous leads. Two or more contiguous leads. Contiguous leads refer to leads that describe the same part of the left ventricle. And again, we'll define that in a little bit more detail in Dr. Benigo Paul's lecture. And the last thing is we want to compare this EKG to a prior EKG if possible. May I also point out something that I don't want to emphasize at all, but that was pointed out by your uh, colleagues, is that you'll see a small little blip. You'll see it in a couple little areas here, mostly in V2 and V3. This could be called a U wave. This is again something we don't want to emphasize. A U wave is a small little blip like that, that is typically one and a half small boxes tall that comes out for the T wave. Now, uh, we also sometimes will use a criteria for us to be able to truly call this a U wave. We like to see it to be five to 15% the amplitude of the T wave. And that's not what we're quite seeing here. And again, it's not greater than one and a half small boxes tall. A U wave can be associated with hypokalemia, hypokalemia. It can also be associated with left ventricular hypertrophy, and it can be also associated with coronary artery disease. But this is not something we want to emphasize, but it is something that's noted to some degree. It doesn't quite meet the criteria for a U wave, so it's really not something that's of any clinical significance. But it was a question raised by your colleagues. So this is a very thorough evaluation of this 12-lead ECG. And my interpretation of this ECG overall, a summary statement will be that this ECG demonstrates normal sinus rhythm, the rate of 66 beats per minute with no other abnormalities. So moving on here, we've gone through the mantra. The question now that comes up is how does this ECG influence your differential diagnosis? I'll have you pause the, the video here to think about the answer to this question. You should only pause this video for about 30 seconds to think about this. And when you unpause this, I'll be here and ready to provide you an answer to this question. And so let's do that right now. The important point we want to make is that a normal ECG, as we see here, does not rule out the possibility of coronary artery disease. What it does help us with is it does certainly rule out the possibility of ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, which again you'll learn about more from Dr. Benico Paul in her subsequent lectures on EKGs and acute coronary syndromes. Another way that this EKG is helpful is that we want to think about the possibility of pericarditis in this differential diagnosis of chest pain. And what we find in this patient is that the EKG here does not show findings that are consistent with pericarditis, and that's something we'll learn more about as well in future lectures. So this ECG doesn't really change our differential diagnosis that much other than the fact that it does rule out an acute coronary syndrome in the form of an ST cell myocardial infarction, and also rules out the possibility of pericarditis.
So the next question that I want you to think about in terms of clinical decision making is as follows. What factors contribute to the decision to pursue a specific type of stress test in a given patient? So I want you to take five or seven minutes to really think about this and work through the answer to this question in much the same way that we work through it in the live lecture or the live team-based learning session. And after you take five to seven minutes to think about this, I'll be here and ready to go through the answer to this question. So let's do that at this point. So when we think about the answer to this question, we want to think about the clinical classification of chest pain. As I mentioned during the live lecture or live TBL session, this is something that I do on a everyday, in my everyday practice when I take care of patients that have the symptom of chest pain. We want to be able to classify it. So when I classify a patient as having typical angina or definite angina, it's defined as a patient having substernal chest pain or discomfort, is provoked by exertion or emotional stress, and is relieved by rest and or nitroglycerin. So a patient needs to meet all three of these criteria to be defined as having typical angina. So if we think about our patient, we think about Mr. Aggie Davis, he did meet all three criteria. So in him, we're thinking about him having typical angina when we classify his chest pain syndrome. Now, a patient is defined as having atypical angina when they have chest pain or discomfort that lacks one of the characteristics of definite or typical angina. So they're meeting two of the three, if you will. And then a patient is defined as having non-anginal chest pain, non-anginal chest pain, when they have chest pain and discomfort that meets one or none, one or none of the typical angina characteristics. So again, when we think about Mr. Aggie Davis, he has typical angina when we classify his chest pain syndrome. Now let's talk about pretest probability of coronary artery disease. So this is based on a patient's age, sex, and the clinical classification of chest pain. So we think of Mr. Aggie Davis. Mr. Aggie Davis has typical angina. As we talked about, he's 66 years old and obviously he's a male as we've discussed. So now we're gonna look at this table. So now we're gonna find his age, so he's greater than 60, and then he's male, and then we're gonna think about what his clinical classification of chest pain is. And he has typical angina, so his pre-test probability for coronary artery disease is high. Now let's take the hypothetical example of a young patient, maybe a patient that is uh, 25 years old, and a 25-year-old patient that has non-anginal chest pain, where in that individual, the pretest probability is going to be really low if they're male and very low if they're female. And so if we look at the, the figure here at the bottom, we define a very low pretest probability as a pretest probability as less than 5%. We define a low pretest probability as being between 5 to 10%. And then we have this large category of intermediate, which ranges from 10 to 90%. As cardiologists, we sort of develop a, a gestalt, if you will, of kind of intermediate low, intermediate medium, and intermediate high. Where we're starting to think about patients being in the 70 to 80% range. And then patients that have high pretest probability are those that have a pretest probability greater than 90%, which is going to be Mr. Aggie Davis. So well, let's explore Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem is a very important concept that you've learned about in your epidemiology course in medical school. So Bayes' theorem in its simplest form refers to the fact that the post-test probability of a disease is influenced by the pretest probability. So again, the post-test probability of disease is influenced by the pretest probability. So when we look at this figure, we have on the x-axis pretest probability here, and the y-axis we have post-test post -test probability. And then we have this dotted line which represents a patient's pretest probability. So let's think about Mr. Aggie Davis. So Mr. Aggie Davis has high pretest probability. So he's on the line here. And so something that we want to think about is if he was to undergo a stress test, and so a lot of the stress tests that we choose, cardiac stress testing, 
um, can really be helpful with intermediate pretest probability patients. But let's focus on Mr. Aggie Davis, which is a high pretest probability patient. Now, if he undergoes a stress test and his stress test is negative, he gets a negative result, he's going to go down to here. He's going to go to this line, this green line here. And so what you'll notice here is that his post-test probability did not change that much because his pretest probability was really high. Now let's talk about the situation where his test is positive. He has an abnormal stress test. Then he's going to go to this line here. And again, his post-test probability is going to increase, but it's not going to change that much. Now let's compare that to another patient where their pretest probability is more intermediate. Now, if this patient has a negative test result, we might feel a little bit more comfortable that we have ruled out coronary artery disease here because there's a bigger change here now, and the post-test probability is relatively low. Here we can say it's about uh, 0.35 or 35%. So it's really changed here. As compared to Mr. Aggie Davis, where the post-test probability remains really high. So if we have a test that shows that the patient is negative or we have a negative result, we might feel like that's a false positive. And that raises, or excuse me, I should say a false negative. We may be concerned that's a false negative. Again, we may be concerned that's a false negative. Now going back to this patient, this hypothetical patient that is intermediate pretest probability, if they have a positive result with their stress test, that really changes things as well, where their post-test probably increases quite a bit, where we might think about doing things a little bit differently, if you will. This is something that is not heavily emphasized in this course, but it's something that we're doing intuitively in medicine every day. You'll learn more about this in terms of your pulmonary course with regard to pulmonary emboli as well and Wall's criteria. So let's move on now and, and tackle that question in a different way. So given Mr. Aggie Davis's pretest probability for coronary artery disease was the next best step in management to help confirm the diagnosis. So again, we said Mr. Aggie Davis has high pretest probability for coronary artery disease. So we want to think about a test where we're really going to get more bang for our buck so that if we do this test, the post-test probability is going to increase quite a bit. Now with that said, it's very important sometimes that we get a lot of physiology in terms of the patient. What I mean by that is that it might be really important to think about reproducing his chest pain in, in a control setting on an exercise stress test, for example. So let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. So when we think about the evaluation of coronary artery disease, among the many options we have available, we can consider exercise treadmill or what's called exercise tolerance test. So this is where we have a patient uh, that exercises on an exercise treadmill with the EKG leads connected to them. And what we're doing is we're monitoring the patient while they're following a very stereotypical protocol. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. And that's a good option, by the way, exercise treadmill tests on patients that have relatively uh, low or lowish intermediate pretest probability for coronary artery disease. Where patients fall into the intermediate category, that's where stress imaging can be very helpful. When we think about stress imaging that can come in the, with exercise in the form of what's called a treadmill stress echocardiogram. So this is a type of stress test where we're using an echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart in, able, in order to be able to do it. Another option is what's called a treadmill cardiac spec study or what's called a nuclear stress test. So we won't go into too much detail, but sometimes a, a treadmill stress echocardiogram is not a good option, particularly in a patient that has abnormalities in their contractile function, where a nuclear stress test or a treadmill cardiac spec study could be more advantageous. Now, as you know, certain patients aren't able to exercise. So if this is an option, a patient can't exercise, then we got to think about what are our options for patients that aren't able to exercise. So what are the stress tests that we have available without exercise? Well, we can do a cardiac MRI with vasodilator stress. That would be considered among uh, the best quality tests that we have available, but it can be very technically challenging to perform. We can also do these nuclear stress tests with pharmacologic agents. 
with vasodilator stress or an agent called dobutamine. Another form of a nuclear stress test uh, that is not that is uh, the CT based, but also uses positron emission tomography, what's called cardiac PET, with vasodilator stress can also be a very good option that has greater sensitivity and specificity than the cardiac spec with vasodilator stress or dobutamine. And then we also have the option of doing a stress echocardiogram with dobutamine or a vasodilator. So again, we have the option of doing a chemical stress echocardiogram or a pharmacologic stress echocardiogram, depending on the terminology that you like to use. Now, one thing I want to introduce you to is the idea of the ischemic cascade. So in terms of the ischemic cascade, one of the first things that happens in a patient that does indeed have coronary artery disease is that they have a full flow maldistribution in the coronary vessels that are involved. With this flow maldistribution, what happens is that there's a decrease in coronary blood flow, which we refer to as hyperperfusion. And then the next step is we have a reduction in compliance, as we talked about earlier, that results in diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. Then also what can happen in the ways that we talked already is that there can be a decrease in contractile function, which we refer to as systolic dysfunction. And then we start to see electrical changes. We see changes in terms of the ECG or the EKG. And finally, patients will have angina. So when you think about a nuclear stress test, it's evaluating parameters that come on very early in terms of the ischemic cascade. And because of that, a nuclear stress test is very sensitive but less specific because it's further away from this endpoint of angina or chest pain as compared to an echocardiogram or echocardiogram or stress test where it's closer to angina, where it has less sensitivity but increased specificity. So this is the way that we think about very stress tests, talking about the relative advantages and disadvantages. Now another thing that our concept or idea that I want to introduce you to is the idea of functional assessment. What we're referring to in terms of functional assessment is the idea that we're, we're looking at physiology. We're not looking directly to see whether a patient has an obstruction with their coronary artery as you would do with a CT coronary angiogram or a CAT scan or as we would with a cardiac catheterization. Here, we're doing anatomic assessment where we're actually looking at the artery to see if there's obstruction as compared to a functional assessment where we're actually looking at physiology, not directly visualizing the coronary artery to see if there's obstruction. And now the problem with the anatomic assessment is as follows. We have coronary resistance to blood flow, which is sometimes difficult to estimate in terms of the percent stenosis. So if this is a, a coronary artery and flow through the arteries in this direction, and this is an image from a coronary angiogram or cardiac catheterization procedure, what happens is that there are what are called interest effects, friction loss, and separation losses that all contribute to a decrease in coronary blood flow. And it is coronary blood flow, after all, that we're really paying attention to. And this is a real challenge when a patient has an irregular stenosis here, where it is not easy to determine what percent stenosis the patient has. More specifically, the drop in pressure across the stenosis is due to the length of the stenosis, the area of that stenosis as compared to the reference area, the drop in pressure across that stenosis, and of course, the coronary flow. That's a, a course, or after all, what we're looking at. And their coefficients are viscous and separation we laminar separation, I should say, in viscous friction, I should be more specific, that we can't account for when we're doing an anatomic assessment. So it is sometimes very helpful to perform a functional assessment before we do an anatomic assessment so that we can determine whether that percent stenosis, whether it's 50% or 70%, is really producing myocardial ischemia. Moving on now, I want to introduce you to this graph here that's very helpful in the evaluation of suspected coronary artery disease. So in any patient where we have suspected ischemic heart disease as shown at the top here, 
we want to first rule out the possibility that they have an acute coronary syndrome. So here they use the term intermediate or high risk unstable angina. Because if we do, we want to follow another algorithm as we'll talk about in the lecture that I'll provide to you in the subsequent days regarding acute coronary syndromes. So when we think about key points here, we want to really emphasize the idea that there are many choices when we're evaluating coronary artery disease, and we should always use a shared decision-making approach, that we should involve a patient in the decision-making and talk about the pros and cons in a very comprehensive fashion. Another key component here is the idea of a resting EKG. A resting EKG, or electrocardiogram, is recommended in any patient with out an obvious non-cardiac cause of chest pain. Really, in any patient where we're evaluating chest pain, we should do an EKG. It can be very helpful. And so when we go back to this algorithm, um, this is a concept here of a comprehensive clinical assessment of risk. That's the idea of shared decision-making and really having a discussion with a patient about the various options available and the pros and cons of that. So as we move down to this algorithm, we want to first ask ourselves, well, has this patient obviously had any recent exercise or cardiac imaging study that might suggest whether they have coronary artery disease already? And if they have not, then we're going to move downward and think about stress testing. If they have, then we want to ask ourselves, is it technically adequate? And can we answer the question whether a patient has coronary artery disease or not? So, if a patient has no contraindication of stress testing, which we're not emphasizing in this course, and the patient's able to exercise, the answer is yes. Uh, we're really going to think about various options, and there are many here. And we won't go into some of the nitty-gritty, other than the fact that we want to know whether the EKG is interpretable or not. Because if the EKG is not interpretable, because there are sometimes changes in the EKG that allow us not to be able to use the EKG, then doing an exercise treadmill test alone is not going to be very helpful because we're so reliant on the EKG itself. And again, if the EKG is not interpretable, then the exercise tolerance test is not going to be helpful. Then we're going to think about doing a nuclear stress test or a stress echocardiogram, and that's what's shown here. That's a really good option when the EKG is not interpretable. If the EKG is interpretable, then we're really going to think about an exercise tolerance test, and that's what's denoted here as a center size exercise EKG. And then, as you know, in the previous slides, we talked about other options such as a pharmacologic cardiac MR. Um, we can even do an anatomical assessment involving a CT coronary angiogram here that's denoted as CCTA. Um, and so again, there are a lot of different options. We're not expecting you to be able to, to differentiate the various options for a given patient, but we do want you to we do want to introduce you to do the many decisions we can make as a cardiologist as far as risk stratifying a patient as having coronary artery disease or not. A couple other important points I want to leave you with is the fact that patients who present with acute angina should be categorized as stable or unstable. And if they're stable, then we feel a little bit more comfortable about thinking about this algorithm. And of course, exercise is always preferred to pharmacological methods, if possible, because we learn so much with exercise. And so we're going to move on here and talk a little bit about a treadmill stress echocardiogram. A treadmill stress echocardiogram would be a good option for Mr. Aggie Davis. So in the live lecture, we talked about a treadmill stress echocardiogram, and it would be a good idea to refer to the, that part of the lecture if you like, but we'll go through it here as well. So when we think about a treadmill stress echocardiogram, there are multiple components. So we have the EKG machine to which the patient is connected to. So if we have a patient here on the treadmill, what happens is that they have EKG leads connected to the patient that are connected to this computer so we can analyze EKG in real time. And then when we're doing a treadmill stress echocardiogram, we're also going to do an echocardiogram. And so this is the machine that allows us to do it. And here is the bed that the patient is going to lie on. So when we do a treadmill stress echocardiogram, the first part is to acquire the echocardiogram images at rest. And we'll review for Mr. Aggie Davis what that looked like. So we'll get images, uh, echocardiographic images at rest because of the simple idea that we want to quantify or qualify, I should say, what the wall motion of the left ventricle looks like at rest. 
And then in a very stereotypical fashion, we'll have a patient exercise on a treadmill. And that goes on to the next slide here, where we're gonna first acquire a resting EKG and resting echocardiographic images. And then we're gonna follow the BRUCE protocol. The BRUCE protocol refers to the exercise protocol that we use most commonly throughout the United States and throughout the world. So a patient has a continuous 12 liter echocardiogram that's taking place at this time. The treadmill increases in terms of grade and intensity every three minutes over seven stages. Blood pressure is checked at each stage because we get a lot of important and helpful information in terms of blood pressure. We know if a patient has high grade disease in the left main coronary artery, which is sort of a tree trunk to the coronary arterial system, that they may have a drop in blood pressure as they exercise with advancing stages. But we also have some patients where they may have a very hypertensive response, which is also abnormal. Meanwhile, the ECG is monitored for any ST segment changes, arrhythmias, or other abnormalities. And if we see ST segment changes, that can raise concern for ECG evidence of myocardial ischemia, and we'll talk about that shortly. Finally, when a patient exercises as far as they can go, or when they get chest pain that prevents them from going any further, we obtain at peak stress, stress images referring to the echocardiogram. So we'll get the patient off the treadmill onto that bed and we'll acquire what are called the stress images. So we'll acquire images using the echocardiogram of the left ventricle at peak stress. And then in the recovery phase, after the patient has some time to rest, the EKG continues to be monitored as well as blood pressure and heart rate. And we're looking to see how quickly the heart rate comes back to normal because that can provide us with a lot of important prognostic information. We're also looking at, again, the blood pressure response. And if there are any ECG changes, such as SC7 elevations or depressions, we are going to see how long it takes for those to recover. So now coming back to Mr. Aggie Davis, this actually is an ECG of the patient at peak stress. And so what we noted in this patient is that this patient had horizontal to upsloping SC segment depressions of at least one and a half millimeters in the inferior leads and in leads V5 and V6. So I'm gonna circle that for you. So the inferior leads are lead two here. And you'll see here that there are definitely SC segment depressions, actually in all these three beats here. And you'll see that here also in lead three in the uh, beats that I have circled. Now you also note that to some degree in lead V5 and to some degree in V6 in that beat, but we're looking to see a consistent pattern of ST segment depressions in each beat. We're not just looking to see in one beat in one lead. And so when a patient has one point one and a half millimeters of ST segment depressions this way, this raises concern that this patient does have ECG evidence of myocardial ischemia. Now, as we talked about in the live lecture, very frequently when we do see ECG changes suggesting myocardial ischemia, we do see it in leads 2, 3, and AVF. But we do consider V5 to be the most helpful lead. When we see SC segment deviations in lead V5, particularly SC segment depressions, this lead is the most specific in terms of ECG evidence of myocardial ischemia. So in particular, Mr. Aggie Davis, he was able to exercise for six minutes and 32 seconds. So the fact that he's able to get beyond six minutes does have some good prognostic value, but he wasn't really able to get that far. The other part to this is we want to think about his angina index. So when he exercised on this stress test, he did get some of that chest discomfort, but he's able to carry onward. So that's why he used the term non-limiting angina. He didn't have any exercise limited angina, he just had non-limiting angina. And so we're able to plug all this information into what's called a Duke treadmill score. And this patient's Duke treadmill score is negative five, which puts them at moderate risk, which means that being a male, that is one year mortality is about 2.9%. So the way we would counsel a patient like this, we would say, Mr. Aggie Davis, based on your symptoms that you're reporting and this stress test thus far, the treadmill component, if we took 100 patients like you, three patients would be at risk of death after one year.
Now, when we're looking at the Duke treadmill score, what we're looking at is the exercise time minus five times the maximal SC segment change, or depression in this case, minus four times the angina index, where we said the angina index is one. And so again, we got a score of negative five, which puts this patient in the moderate risk category as shown here. We show that when a patient has a score of five or higher, that they're low risk. And then we show that a patient that has a score uh, that's less than negative 11 or is a high risk patient. One other point that's really important that we emphasize in the live lecture is that the distribution or the leads involved in terms of the ST segment changes on an exercise treadmill test do not localize to the coronary artery involved. They do not localize to the coronary artery involved. In contrast to a resting EKG, where if a patient does have ST segment elevations or ST segment depressions, that localizes to the coronary artery involved. But when a patient undergoes an exercise treadmill test, following the Bruce protocol, for example, and we see ST segment depressions here in at least two, three in AVF, we would not predict that there would be involvement in the right coronary artery. It doesn't localize. Again, it does not localize. So an important concept and point. So shown here are the resting images of the echocardiogram that was performed for this patient. So as we talk about the live lecture, we talked about the representative walls of the left ventricle. So we'll focus on the parasternal law axis view. To orient you, this is a left ventricle. And this is the aorta, and this is a left atrium. And, and what's happening is blood is flowing through the mitral valve from the left atrium into the left ventricle, and from the left ventricle out through the aorta. But what we're really paying attention to in terms of this parasternal long axis view is the fact that this wall here represents the anteroseptal wall of the left ventricle, and this represents the posterior wall of the left ventricle, sometimes referred to as the infralateral wall of the left ventricle. So at rest, we see no wall motion abnormalities. We see adequate contraction. Here we have the apical four chamber view. And here again is the left ventricle. And what we find here is the anterior lateral wall. So this is the anterior lateral wall of the left ventricle. This is the apex of the left ventricle. Remember, in that first lecture of the heart, I talked to you about the apex of the heart and the base of the heart. So this is the apex of the heart. And here is what's called the septum of the left ventricle. So we have the basal inferoseptum, we have the mid inferoseptum, and then we have the apical septum here. So that's the apical four chamber view, and those are the representative walls of the left ventricle we're able to see. Now the apical two chamber view, we again have the left ventricle, and here we have the anterior wall, in contrast to the anterior lateral wall that we talked about here. This is the anterior wall. Again, this is the apex, and then this is the inferior wall. And here we see good contraction, good systolic motion, a normal ejection fraction of the left ventricle, or the visual estimate of the left ventricle ejection fraction to my eye is 55%, which is normal. And then we have the parasternal short axis view, where we've cut the left ventricle into a donut, if you will. And what happens here is that this is the anterior wall, this is the lateral wall, this is the inferior wall, and this is a septal wall of the left ventricle. And actually what you're seeing here is a papillary muscle, actually. And again, left ventricular function is normal, taking into account all the images that we've shown. So now we're moving on, and this is Mr. Aggie Davis in the stress phase. So in the peak phase, after he completed six minutes and 32 seconds of the Bruce protocol. And so now when we look at the parasternal long axis view, what we find here is the apex in a portion of the anterior septal wall is not contracting the way it did at rest. So what we're seeing here, seeing here is we are starting to see echocardiographic evidence of inducible myocardial ischemia related to the fact that there's systolic dysfunction at peak stress. Now, this is apical four chamber view. So again, in the apical wall, and to some degree, even in the distal septal wall, and in the anterior lateral wall, we see hypokinesis, but it's definitely most pronounced here in the apex.
And then moving on in the apical two-chamber view, here we see that the anterior wall is not moving that well here. It's not contracting, it's not thickening as it should. And we see that also in the apex. And then when we go to the parasternal short axis view, we see again that the anterior wall, and to some degree the anterior lateral wall, and a small portion of the septal wall all throughout this area are not contracting normally. And so we're going to put all these images together and think about the fact that we have involvement of the anterior lateral wall, the apex, and the anterior wall, and to some degree the distal septal wall. And so that makes us think about the left anterior descending artery, particularly the mid left anterior descending artery, as being the culprit here. It's not important for you as a medical student to recognize that it's a mid left anterior descending artery, but it is very important for you uh, to recognize that it is a left anterior descending artery based on the walls of the left ventricle I described. So moving on, the next question is, in terms of clinical decision making, what is the diagnosis? So I'll give you 30 seconds here to think about this. You can pause uh, the video if you like. If you watch the live video, you know the answer to this question already. And so coming to the answer now that you've unpaused the video, the answer is this patient has stable angina, which is sometimes referred to as stable ischemic heart disease. And the European Society of Cardiology guidelines that were published last year they will refer to this as a chronic coronary syndrome in contrast to an acute coronary syndrome. They call this again a chronic coronary syndrome, but most individuals refer to this as stable angina. So when we think about Mr. Aggie Davis, the reason why we think about him as having stable angina is that he has chest pain with exertion that's relieved by rest that does not occur Spontaneously at rest, it only occurs with activity. It's substernal location. We talked earlier about how his chest pain syndrome was consistent with typical angina. We talked about how his pretest probability for coronary artery disease was high. And we even talked earlier in terms of the differential diagnosis about why he didn't have an acute coronary syndrome. And so when we put all this information together, this patient's diagnosis is stable angina. Further confirmed and validated by the fact the patient has an abnormal treadmill stress echocardiogram. So putting physiology to clinical practice, we're going to change gears here and ask you, what are risk factors for coronary artery disease in this patient and in general? So I want you to think about, in this specific patient, what are the risk factors that Mr. Aggie Davis has? And in general, what are risk factors that we're looking out for? And I want you to take about two minutes to think about the answer to this question. I really want you to challenge yourself. I want you to think about what are risk factors that we want to combat in a patient to really prevent them from having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So now would be a good time to pause the video and when you're ready to unpause the video so I can provide you with the answer to this question. So let's do that now. So I would refer to this slide as traditional risk factors. So the risk factors listed here are traditional risk factors. And the way that I would categorize risk factors as risk factors as modifiable and non-modifiable. So modifiable and non-modifiable. So modifiable are risk factors that the patient can control. So we want to make sure that we are Having a patient's LDL cholesterol, which is a big risk factor for hyperlipidemia and coronary artery disease, under control. So in a patient that has known coronary artery disease, we would want to target an LDL cholesterol of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Another modifiable risk factor is hypertension. In Mr. Aggie Davis, he had very poorly controlled blood pressure. We know when a patient has elevated blood pressure and we're concerned about coronary artery disease, that's gonna increase myocardial oxygen consumption. So we wanna work really hard to get this patient on appropriate antihypertensive therapy to reduce the blood pressure, in Mr. Aggie's case, to also reduce his myocardial oxygen consumption. 
diabetes mellitus. That was another risk factor that Mr. Aggie Davis has. We know that having poorly controlled diabetes can be a very important risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Another important entity here is lack of physical activity, which can be tied to obesity. We know that patients that are able to exercise 150 minutes and of uh, exercise, a moderate strenuous exercise, I should say, are fundamentally different than patients that are not able to do so. We know the patients that are able to commit to the 150 minutes of moderate strenuous exercise per week are less likely to suffer cardiovascular disease. And then obesity. We talked about how Mr. Aggie Davis was overweight. We know that if he's able to lose 10% of his body weight over the next year, that that can make a big difference as far as reducing his blood sugars and maybe taking him out of the category of diabetes and maybe putting him in the pre-diabetes category. But we know obesity itself is linked to cardiovascular disease. And this was not an issue in Mr. Aggie Davis, who was not a cigarette or tobacco user, but tobacco use remains a major issue in this country. I will say, though, fortunately, smoking cessation substantially reduces cardiovascular risk within two years, with risk returning to the level of a non-smoker after approximately 10 years. So we have to make sure our patients that smoke that really help them understand the fact that if they do stop smoking, that over a short period of time, they can really make a big difference. And the fact that um, if they're able to quit and not be a smoker for an extended period of time, then their life expectancy can be almost back to normal. Now, non-modifiable risk factors. A patient can't control their age, their sex, heredity, or, or their genes, heredity. Uh, one thing to remember in terms of sex is that we talk about how um, premenopausal women have some protection in terms of not developing cardiovascular disease. But the issue is that once a woman becomes menopausal, they quickly catch up to men. As far as genetics, we're really going to think about genetics being an important contributor to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, in particular coronary artery disease, if they develop it before the age of 45 as a male or before the age of 55 as a female. That's going to really raise a, a lot of concern uh, for us. One last thing I'll also mention is alcohol. Alcohol comes up quite a bit. So regular moderate alcohol consumption, one to two drinks daily for men or one drink daily for women, has been associated with a decreased incidence of cardiovascular disease. Because of the known deleterious effects of drinking, the American Heart Association states the following. So if a patient is already drinking alcohol, you can encourage them to continue to drink alcohol in moderation because of the fact that it's cardioprotective. But if a patient is not drinking alcohol, you shouldn't necessarily encourage a patient to drink alcohol to get that cardioprotective effect. And that comes from the American Heart Association, a, a very important organization that advocates to help decrease incidence of cardiovascular disease. So moving on here, moving from basic to translational science, the question I want to ask you is what other factors might contribute to coronary atherosclerosis? So I'm going to digress for a second here and really emphasize that the part of our, the point I should say of our team-based learning sessions is not only to review past material, but to challenge you in ways that you have not been challenged in the past and in other courses perhaps. We want you to think about things that may not be in your textbook or may not be obvious to you and may be only evident in a team-based learning session. And that's where this question comes from. We want to introduce you to ideas or concepts that are not in your syllabus that are going to be really important for you to think about in the future because we know in medicine that you need to be a lifelong learner and that what we teach you in this cardiovascular systems course is not necessarily going to be that relevant 10, 15, 20 years from now. And we have to introduce you to cutting edge research. So take uh, 30 seconds here, if not longer, to think about the answer to these questions. We did talk about this in terms of a live video. So if you don't recall, now is a good time to maybe look back at your notes from that live session to think about the answer to this question. After you, you pause the session and looked at it, 
please come back here and we'll talk about it. And at this point, we'll do so. So one of the most important things or concepts or ideas that I want to introduce you to is a lipid parameter referred to as lipoprotein little a. So lipoprotein little a consists of apoprotein B100, apoprotein B100. So apoprotein B100 is a component of many forms of cholesterol. It's a component of LDL, it's a component of very low density lipoproteins, it's a component of intermediate density lipoproteins. So it's a part of a lot of different cholesterol components and it makes up lipoprotein little a. And so lipoprotein little a consists of the usual players, if you will, uh, usual components of lipids and proteins with a little a protein that's connected by a disulfid linkage as shown here. So that's the disulfid linkage and this is the little a protein component. And so that's why I refer to this cholesterol parameter as lipoprotein little a. So the atherogenicity of lipoprotein little a is modulated by pro-inflammatory pro-thrombotic and pro-atherogenic effects. So when we talk about pro-atherogenic effects of lipoprotein little a, we're talking about the fact that there's increased endothel endothelial cell binding. So lipoprotein little a is gonna bind the endothelial cell. And because it does that, it's going to be pro-atherogenic in that way. It also results in an increase in upregulation of adhesion mo molecules. There's also an increase in smooth muscle cell proliferation. There's proteoglycan matrix binding, an increase in that. There's an increase in foam cell formation. So you'll remember how I mentioned earlier about how oxidized LDL or oxidized phospholipids are taken up by macrophages. When that takes place, what happens is foam cells form. Foam cells are an important component of plaque, particularly necrotic plaque necrotic plaque. So when you have an increase in foam cell formation, we have also an increase in necrotic core formation and also an increase in lesion calcification that we know that different components of the coronary vessel can actually form osteoblasts and we can have calcium formation. Now there are also pro-inflammatory effects of lipoprotein little a which are mediated by the fact there's an increase in oxidized phospholipids. And there's also an increase in macrophage interleukin-8 expression. There's also an increase in monocyte cytokine release. There's also monocyte chemotaxis uh, as well. And then there's also a monocyte chemoattractive protein that's carried on it that has a pro-inflammatory effect. Now, in terms of prothrombotic effects, we have a decrease in plasminogen activation. We have a decrease in fibrin degradation. And then we have an increase in platelet responsiveness which as you'll learn about, if you haven't already, uh, will really emphasize in the acute coronary, coronary syndrome lecture how an increase in platelet responsiveness is a real culprit in coronary thrombosis or atherothrombosis, I should say. So lipoprotein little a is an important mediator of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I think this probably will not be on step one, but it's a concept or entity that you should be aware of that might slowly get into step one at some point in the future. Now let's talk about clonal hematopoiesis. So you might think, what does clonal hematopoiesis have to do with cardiology? So a mutation in a hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow, as shown in the top panel here, confers an expansion advantage that yields a clone of mutant leukocytes that appear in peripheral blood that's shown in the middle panel. So I'm gonna repeat that one more time. So when we have a hematopoietic stem cell, it can undergo a mutagenetic event, a mutagenic event. And then there's a clonal expansion that takes place such that there's a whole bunch of these cells in the periphery. And there are somatically mutated cells in the peripheral blood. So it's really important to understand the concept, somatically mutated cells in the peripheral blood. Now two, two things happen, or two broad categories of things happen. There's a 40% increase in risk of cardiovascular disease, and that's because of the fact that this clonal hematopoiesis that takes place results in accelerated atherosclerosis. It also can result in thrombosis, and there are changes that take place that can also result in heart failure. 
So again, this together results in a 40% increase in risk of cardiovascular disease. What's interesting is that typically when we think about changes in terms of clonal hematopoiesis, we think about one being at risk for lymphoma or leukemia, hematologic malignancies. And what we find is that risk with this event taking place is only less than 1% per year. And so by and large, with this mutation that occurs in hemopoietic stem cells, we're resulting in atherosclerosis. This definitely won't be on Yosemite step one, but this is something described by Peter Libby and colleagues. Peter Libby is a uh, leading cardiologist out of uh, Harvard Medical School uh, that has really uh, shed a lot of light on this topic. And we're gonna learn more about this in the coming years. So I wanna make sure that you're aware of this. Now, last but not least is the idea of long non-coding RNAs. So long non-coding RNAs are actively transcribed genes that do not appear to code for proteins. Emerging evidence suggests that long non-coding RNAs serve as key regulators of atherosclerosis and related risk factors. So we're talking about how long non-coding RNAs really affect the plaque. So inside the lesion, so it affects immune cells. We know that coronary artery disease is an immune mediated process to some degree. It also affects endothelial cells and endothelial function. We also know that it can cause an increase in smooth muscle cell proliferation. So long non-coding RNAs have a direct effect on the plaque. In addition, it can be associated with dyslipidemia, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, all culprits in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I also want to take a moment to mention that on your course website, I've provided lectures to all these topics, including long non-coding RNAs, hemopoietic stem cells, and lipoprotein little a, uh, which will not be tested in this course, but at your leisure, feel free to expand upon what we've discussed briefly here. So now we're getting into more of the meat and potatoes of this actual lecture. So we're gonna put physiology into clinical practice. So I have some questions for you to think about. First and foremost, what is the physiologic basis for myocardial ischemia in Mr. Aggie Davis? The next question, why does this patient only experience symptoms with exertion and not at rest? And last but not least, what are the major determinants of myocardial oxygen supply and demand? So these are really fundamental questions to this team-based learning session. They are also very much related to Dr. Amsterdam's lectures that he's given to you in terms of coronary artery disease, pathophysiology, and stable angina. If you're able to answer these questions comprehensively, it really shows to date that you understand the topics that we've discussed. So I want you to take five or 10 minutes to really think about the answer to these questions. We briefly got a chance to talk about this in terms of the live lecture. Now here, moving forward, I'm gonna discuss this in, in good detail in a way I hope that really solidifies what these questions are really having you think about in terms of pathophysiology. So again, I would pause the video for five or 10 minutes, think about the answer to these questions and return uh, to the video so we can go through these questions together. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna go through the answer to the first question. So the first question, what is the physiologic basis for myocardial ischemia in this patient? A really fundamental, important question. So remember, when we think about the regulation of coronary blood flow, we first have to think about how the coronary vasculature works. So shown here are the two compartments of the coronary circulation. So we have the epicardial or conductance vessel. So that's like the left anterior descending artery, the left main coronary artery, the left circumflex artery, or the right coronary artery. And then we have the resistance vessels or the microvasculature, but we've been a little bit more specific. You'll remember in our first lecture, I referred to the resistance vessels as the pre-arterials and the arterioles. And that's what's shown here. So at rest, we have normal microvascular tone. So at rest, we really don't need to 
augment coronary blood flow because of the fact that uh, we have normal microvascular tone. And so when we think about the red blood cell circulating from the epicardial conduction vessel into the pre-arterial, into the arterial, and ultimately to the capillary, at rest there's going to be a good gas exchange to the ventricular myocyte. Now what happens in a patient like yourself, a normal patient that's healthy, is that with exercise, we're gonna to need to increase coronary blood flow by three or four times so that when that red blood cell circulates from the, or through the epicardial coronary vessel and ultimately through the microvascular and into the capillary, there's enough oxygen delivery to the ventricular myocyte because now there's gonna be an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. And so to meet that demand, we have to have adequate supply. And so the question is, how are you going to have adequate supply? So to some degree, the epicardial coronary vessel is going to vasodilate, but the epicardial coronary vessel is not regulating coronary blood flow. It's not the resistance vessel the way the pre-arterial arterioles are. And so what's going to happen is that the pre-arterials and arterioles, they're going to really vasodilate. And the way they vasodilate, as we'll talk about in the subsequent slides, is related to local mediators. These local mediators include, include adenosine and nitric oxide, for example. And so it's these local mediators that are causing vasodilation of the pre arterials and arterioles, or generally, generally speaking, the microvasculature. And so by having vasodilation here, we're able to augment coronary blood flow three to four times so that our coronary supply meets the demand at the level of the ventricular myocyte. Now let's talk about Mr. Aggie Davis. Let's talk about a fixed stenosis. Let's talk about Mr. Aggie Davis having, for example, a 70% stenosis in the mid left anterior descending artery. Now if we focus in on the epicardial coronary vessel, the left anterior descending artery, we know because we have plaque, this plaque now is going to in impart resistance. So we know that there's going to be a pressure drop. So in this hypothetical example, the pressure drops from 100 millimeters of mercury to 70 millimeters of mercury. So the change in pressure here is 30 millimeters of mercury. And so what needs to happen at rest to make sure there's adequate delivery of the red blood cell through the left anterior descending artery and the microvasculature and ultimately to the capillary and the ventricular myocyte is that there's going to be some vasodilation of the pre-arterial and arterial at rest. And because there is vasodilation at rest, we're able to augment our coronary blood flow at rest to a degree that's adequate where Mr. Aggie Davis is not going to have any chest pain. Remember, Mr. Aggie Davis does not have any chest pain at rest, and this explains it. The fact, again, the microvascular is vasodilating to a degree where coronary blood flow is adequate in this scenario. Now, when Mr. Aggie Davis exercises, there's several things that take place. Now, remember, when one exercises, there is activation of the sympathetic nervous system. When there's activation of the sympathetic nervous system, what will happen is that there will be vasoconstriction at the level of the epicardial coronary vessel, and that's shown here. So there's vasoconstriction of the epicardial vessel, so the pressure drop across that plaque is even greater. There's greater resistance here. So now the pressure drop in this hypothetical example is 60 millimeters of mercury. It's a pressure drop from 100 millimeters of mercury to 40 millimeters of mercury. And now what has to happen in terms of the microvasculature, the level of the pre arterials and arterioles, is there has to be further vasodilation. But remember, we can only vasodilate or increase our coronary blood flow by three to four times. And because Mr. Aggie Davis did some of the vasodilation at rest, Mr. Aggie Davis can only do so much more with exercise. And because Mr. Aggie Davis cannot vasodilate such a coronary blood flow at the level of the microvasculars three to four times, what happens is that Mr. Aggie Davis starts to experience chest pain but there, because there's inadequate supply for the demand. So the ventricular myocyte is not getting enough oxygen delivery in this situation. And so um, please uh, make sure that you understand what I've described in this slide. It's very fundamental to this course. If what I've explained to you is not clear, please consider watching this slide or this explanation one more time. But also do not 
be afraid to reach out to myself or Dr. Venegopal or even Dr. Amsterdam. But this is a very fundamental concept to this topic of coronary artery disease. Now let's move on and talk about the answer to the next question. Why does this patient only experience symptoms with exertion and not at rest? So we've really talked about that already, but let me show you another graph from your syllabus that'll be really helpful. So on the x-axis here, we have lesion diameter. So on the x-axis, we have lesion diameter. On the y-axis, we have normalized mean flow. So many years ago, we had this experiment that demonstrated what's taking place in terms of a, a coronary artery. So let's take the example again of Mr. Aggie Davis, and let's say in that stenosis he has of his left anterior descending artery that we hypothetically can change the degree of stenosis. So over a wide range of diameter stenosis from all the way from, let's say, 5% to all the way to about 65%, let's say. Actually, we should say 70%. What we find here is that in terms of rest state coronary flow, that when you go in this range here, that we have a adequate coronary blood flow. We have adequate coronary blood flow. But what happens is that when we start to get into the range of 90% or greater, what happens is that you will start to experience chest pain even at rest because you're not able to augment your coronary blood flow adequately in this scenario at the level of the microvasculars we talked about in the previous slide. So again, in this region, so if we have a 20% stenosis, even a 60% stenosis, even at rest, we're able to augment our coronary, uh, we're, we're, excuse me, even at rest, we're able to have adequate coronary blood flow. We're able to augment coronary blood flow in a way that there's really no change. But again, when we start to have a high-grade stenosis, we'll even have chest pain at rest because we can't augment our coronary blood flow adequately, even at rest. Now, when we think about Mr. Aggie Davis and we think about exercise, and we think about a 70% stenosis. So we're specifically talking about Mr. Aggie Davis, and let's say we have a 70% stenosis. So at rest here, we have adequate coronary blood flow. But what happens with exercise is that we're, we're on this part of the curve here, and we're not actually three to four times. So Mr. Aggie Davis with a 70% stenosis is really gonna start to experience chest discomfort in the ways that we described in the previous slide. And so that's summarized here, that if you have a 70% or greater stenosis, you probably will have exercise-induced angina. If you have a 90% or greater stenosis, then you're most likely going to have rust angina. So again, really key uh, concepts here that we really wanted to get through, where we really want to emphasize that uh, when we're talking about rust over a wide range of stenoses, we're able to maintain adequate coronary blood flow. But when we talk about a 70% stenosis, for example, with exercise, we're not going to be able to maintain coronary blood flow. And then going back to the example of rest coronary flow, when we have like a 95% stenosis, what happens is that we're not able to have enough vasodilation of the microvasculature even at rest, such that there's a supply-demand mismatch. We don't have adequate supply for the myocardial oxygen demand. And that gets our next question. What are the major determinants of myocardial oxygen supply and demand? Well, I've emphasized already that I don't want you to memorize anything in this course, really. I want you to understand concepts. But here, there may need to be some memorization necessary. So let's first talk about myocardial, myocardial oxygen supply. So that's really dependent on O2 content. In other words, the amount of oxygen that's being delivered in the blood and the red blood cell to the ventricular myocyte. So O2 can, content is directly related to coronary blood flow. O2 content is directly related to coronary blood flow. And so what are the determinants of coronary blood flow? Well, it's dependent on coronary perfusion pr pressure. Coronary perfusion pressure. So coronary perfusion pressure is really the aortic diastolic pressure. We talked about how coronary vessels are filled during diastole. So the aortic diastolic pressure is really the coronary perfusion pressure. And so what's interesting is this idea of intrinsic regulation that we'll talk about in a second. 
So coronary blood flow is not only dependent on coronary perfusion pr pressure, it's also dependent on coronary vascular resistance. So coronary vascular resistance is dependent on external compression and, a, and intrinsic regulation. What is meant by external compression? Well, when we have an epicardial coronary vessel and we have a myocardium that runs along it, what happens is that if the heart is beating more vigorously, there's going to be more compression of the coronary vessel. And so that external compression will intrinsically impart some resistance to the coronary vessel. The other key component is the idea of intrinsic regulation. So those are local metabolites. So we talked about how those local metabolites include adenosine and agents like endothelial factors and nitric oxide. And what happens is that with intrinsic regulation, we're able to vasodilate the microvasculature. And what's really interesting is that over a wide range of pressures, we're able to maintain coronary blood flow. And that has to do with intrinsic regulation. And what I mean by a wide range of pressures is that we can have a sudden drop in terms of systemic pressure, such that the aortic diastolic pressure drops quite a bit. But because of intrinsic regulation, the coronary pressure is maintained. Coronary blood flow is maintained. So that's myocardial, myocardial oxygen supply. Let's now move on and talk about myocardial oxygen demand, where we use abbreviation MVO2. So let's talk about the easy stuff first, heart rate. We know that when a patient's heart rate is faster or higher, that the heart has to work harder. This was something you learned last year and was tested on your cardiac physiology assessment. And for the most part, all of you answered that question correctly. So heart rate. We know that when the heart rate increases, that's going to increase myocardial oxygen demand, or MVO2. Contractility, or inotropic state. So increasing contractility, or inotropy, also increases MVO2, or myocardial oxygen consumption, because the rate of tension development is increased, as well as the magnitude of tension. And what do those things both do? Well, they both result in an increase in ATP hydrolysis and oxygen consumption. So again, there's a rate of tension development that's increased as well as a magnitude of that tension. And that's how contractility results in an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. And then there's a concept of wall stress. So wall stress is really represented by Laplace's law which I'll talk to you a lot about when we get to our heart failure lecture. Laplace's law is really critical in understanding wall stress. So Laplace's law says that the transmural pressure times the radius divided by two times the wall thickness is the wall stress. And so when we're talking about the left ventricle and thinking about it in terms of a cylindrical structure, Laplace's law is very applicable. And we know if we increase transmural pressure that we can result in an increase in terms of wall stress. We know that if we, for example, decrease, excuse me, if we increase the diameter of the left ventricle, such as what happens with the dilated cardiomyopathy, a dilated cardiomyopathy, we're going to increase wall stress as well. We know if we have thinning of the left ventricle, which can also happen with a dilated cardiomyopathy, that's going to cause an increase in wall stress. And whenever we have an increase in wall stress, we're going to have an increase in myocardial oxygen demand. So a really important figure as well that I really want to make sure you review before your midterm and your final exam as well as step one, uh, because you will certainly have questions related to this topic. What, should, what I should also point out is that this is a balance. We want to make sure that these are equal, that supply meets the demand. And when we have a mismatch of the two, we are going to have issues of myocardial ischemia and even myocardial infarction and ultimately myocardial necrosis, as we'll learn more about in your acute coronary syndrome lecture. Now moving on, another question I want you to think about when we put physiology to clinical practice is, what therapies can be administered to this patient to reduce symptoms of chest pain? So what therapies can be administered to this patient to reduce symptoms of chest pain? 
So here again, I want you to pause the video. I want you to take three to five minutes to really think about the answer to this question. This was reviewed in your lectures with Dr. Amsterdam. It's also in your syllabus, but I'll also subsequently provide you with a nice table that'll be helpful for you when you review for your, your quiz, midterm, and final exam, as well as step one. So again, take a couple minutes to think about the answer to this question. And then once you are able to do so, um, please unpause the video and join me. So moving on here, I think the answer to this question is best represented in terms of this table of antianginal therapy, antianginal therapy. So let's think about this in terms of drug classes. So the first drug class to think about is organic nitrates. So believe it or not, you will definitely have questions related to this table. So make sure you understand this table completely. So when we miss our organic nitrates, what happens is that we can have a decrease in myocardial oxygen demand. And that has to do with the fact that we have a decrease in preload. We have a decrease in preload. This is related to venodilation induced by the organic nitrate. There's decreased myocardial oxygen demand which is really due to the fact that we have a decrease in, in wall stress. Um, that's really going to help decrease myocardial oxygen demand, but specifically it's a decrease in preload. Okay, the other thing here is that there's going to be increase in oxygen supply. Why does that happen? Well, remember the organic nitrates are going to combat the coronary vasospasm. They're going to cause vasodilation. So there's going to be an increase in coronary perfusion and a decrease in coronary vasospasm. Together, that's going to increase oxygen supply. So remember, organic nitrates are antianginal therapy because they decrease myocardial oxygen demand, which is mediated by a decrease in preload, and there's also an increase in oxygen supply, which is related to the fact that there's increase in coronary perfusion that's related to a decrease in coronary vasospasm. Let's move on now and talk about beta blockers. Actually, I'm sorry, before I do so, remember the adverse effects. Certainly patients that are put on nitrates can have a headache related to vasodilation of the cerebral circulation. Organic nitrates also have an effect in terms of blood pressure. They can cause hypotension. This is related to the fact that if we drop preload too much, that we will have a decrease in cardiac output. And the other thing is because of this decrease in preload, we may have a reflex tachycardia. So those are among the adverse effects for organic nitrates. Now, moving on, let's talk about beta blockers. So what beta blockers do is they certainly decrease myocardial oxygen demand. How does that take place? Well, there's a decrease in contractility in the ways that uh, you understand and we talked about in our first lecture. We talked about how um, beta blockers, uh, how they mediate, or how the sympathetic nervous system really mediates sympathomimetic activity, as the name suggests. And so beta blockers block that effect, so there's going to be a decrease in terms of contractility. There'll be also a decrease in terms of heart rate. And there's also a decrease in terms of wall stress whenever there's a decrease in blood pressure. So I added this to the figure in your syllabus, the decrease in wall stress, because there's a decrease in blood pressure, there will be a decrease in wall stress. So all three of these factors are going to result in a decrease in myocardial oxygen demand and they're mediated by a decrease in contractility, which is combating the effect of the sympathetic activation of the nervous system. Now, what are adverse effects? Well, there can be AV nodal blockades, so we can have excessive bradycardia with beta blockers. In patients that have systolic heart failure, beta blockers can make things worse. You can have a decrease in, or further decrease in LV contractile function, so you want to think about that. Sometimes patients can have comorbidities such as asthma, and so bronchoconstriction can be a limitation of beta blockers. Sometimes we'll overcome that by using more selective beta blockers so that those patients don't experience bronchoconstriction. It may also worsen diabetic control. There are certain beta blockers that have less of that effect, but that's certainly a concern. We, we know when patients develop hypoglycemia, there's an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And in that scenario, we don't want patients necessarily to, to not be aware of the symptoms. That can be very uh, concerning. We use the term hypoglycemic unawareness that we want to avoid. And patients can also develop a fatigue. Uh, many patients 
report to me that, the doc, I really can't carry on. I feel too tired with this medication. So in that situation, we have to think about reducing the dose or withdrawing the medication. Now the next class of medications that we need to think about are calcium channel blockers. And so when we think about calcium channel blockers, we have to think about the type of calcium jaw blockers. So we're really focused here on non-dihydropyridine receptor antagonists like diltiazem or verapamil. And they're denoted here by V and D. So verapamil and diltiazem. And again, these are non-dihydropine receptor antagonists. These are in contrast to agents like amlodipine, which are dihydropine receptor antagonists, which may have some benefit. And we'll compare and contrast them in a second here. So when we talk about um, brapamil diltiazem or non-dihydropine receptor antagonists, they result in venodilation. The venodilation is gonna re result in a decrease in preload in much the same way as organic nitrates. What also happens with these agents is that there's a decrease in wall stress because there's a decrease in blood pressure. So we want to really think about that, is that there's a decrease in wall stress, a decrease in blood pressure. Also, in particular, with verapamil and dotizum, again, in particular with verapamil and dotizum, that they have a negative ionotropic effect. They decrease contractility. That is referred to as a negative ionotropic effect. Verapamil and dotizum will also result in a decrease in heart rate. Now, I want you to remember again, amlodipine. This is again a dihydropyridine receptor antagonist. And really, amlodipine does not have an effect in terms of the heart rate or contractility. All it's really going to do, actually, is it actually can cause vasodilation. And it is also going to result in preload. And, and that can be beneficial, obviously, in the ways that we've discussed. Now, there are a whole host of adverse effects associated with these medications. There can be headache, flushing. When we're talking about verapamil diltiazem, there can be a decrease in LV contraction. We definitely want to avoid these medications in patients that have systolic heart failure, as we'll learn about. Uh, these medications, verapamil diltiazem, can result in marked bradycardia. Uh, they can also result in edema, but this is especially attributed to nifedipine and diltiazem and constipation. Constipation can be a real problem with these non dihydropine receptor antagonists, particularly in the form of verapamil. Now, I apologize here. I think I may have uh, skipped this part, that we, we want to emphasize an increase in oxygen supply, which is related to an increase in coronary perfusion and a decrease in coronary vasospasm. And this is really the benefit of amlodipine. Amlodipine is really going to have this effect primarily, though amlodipine also decreases blood, blood, blood pressure. We think of it, I did talk about how it may decrease preload, but really amlodipine is more of an afterload reducer. It's going to have more effect on afterload than per se preload. Um, so it's going to decrease blood pressure, so it's going to decrease wall stress. So in terms of amlodipine, I would think less so in terms of its effect in terms of preload and more of its effect in terms of afterload. Now, another agent I want you to think about is ranolazine. Ranolazine is a medication that has been studied uh, that affects the late phase inward sodium current. And so in ways that are not clear to us, it decreases the late phase inward sodium current. And in so doing so, it decreases angina. The adverse effects associated with this medication involve dizziness and headache, as well as constipation and nausea. We're also very careful to monitor liver function tests when a patient is started on a medication like this because of its adverse effects in terms of liver function. But ranolazine is another anti anginal agent. I will digress and say that anecdotally, I find it to be less effective. It is really listed here at the bottom of this table because it is, it is a last resort agent for patients that really require anti anginal therapy. Now moving on is additional medical therapy. This is really relevant to patients uh, in terms of acute coronary syndrome, but certainly relevant to some degree in patients that have stable angina. In all patients that have documented coronary artery disease, whether they have stable angina or an acute coronary syndrome, aspirin is gonna be a real foundation of therapy. The way aspirin works is it inhibits platelet aggregation. 
and therefore, excuse me, reduces the release of platelet-derived procoagulants and vasoconstrictors. And so again, aspirin is a really found, important foundation to treatment of stable angina as well as acute coronary syndromes because it's going to be very important as far as preventing coronary thrombosis or atherothrombosis. The concern here with aspirin is that some patients will experience bleeding with it, particularly from the uh, stomach. They can develop peptic ulcer disease. And so enteric coated aspirin can provide some advantages there. And certainly we know that patients, a group of patients can develop asthma as a result of using aspirin. Now, there's another class of medications that I want you to be aware of called P2Y12 inhibitors. They include clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. Now, clopidogrel and prasugrel are what are called thionopyridines. So these are thionopyridines that form the class of agents of P2Y12 inhibitors. And so the P2Y12 receptor or P2Y12 component or the PY12, I should say, is a component of the ADP receptor. So more generally speaking, if you will, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor inhibit the ADP receptor, but they're particularly inhibiting the P2Y12 component of the ADP receptor. Ticagrelor is a CPTP inhibitor. I will spare you the long name associated with that. We'll stick to the acronym. But again, these are all um, antiplatelet agents. So clopidogrel is an irreversible oral prodrug, so it needs to undergo two oxidation steps before it's able to inhibit the platelet P2Y12 ADP receptor, thereby preventing platelet activation and aggregation. The major concern with this medication is that it can cause bleeding. Now, Presigol is another thionopyridine. It also is irre an irreversible oral prodrug, but it only needs to undergo one oxidation step and it also inhibits the platelet P2Y12 ADP receptor, thereby preventing platelet activation and aggregation. And then ticagrelor. The advantage of ticagrelor is that it's reversible and it's an orally active drug, so it doesn't need to undergo any oxidation steps, and it directly inhibits the P2Y12 ADP receptor at an allosteric binding site. Its adverse effects include bleeding, shortness of breath, and atrioventricular block. In fact, about 25% of patients, based on the Plato clinical trial that was used to study this medication, needed to stop the medication because of shortness of breath. Now, the reason why clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor are particularly are important is that when patients undergo a myocardial infarction, whether they're treated with medical therapy or undergo mechanical revascularization with cabbage surgery, coronary artery bypass graft surgery, or stent placement, the addition of these agents to aspirin, one of these three agents to aspirin, can prevent future myocardial infarction, stroke, and even death. So it is a life-saving therapy. Now, these medications are particularly critical when we think about percutaneous coronary intervention or stent placement. So whenever we place a stent, we are placing a drug-coated strength. And now we're placing a, co a drug-coated stent into an epicardial vessel. We do not implant them into pre-arterials and arterioles because the smallest stent we have available is two millimeters, which is much, much larger than a pre-arterial or arterial. And so once we implant a stent, which is coated with a drug, oftentimes serolimus, everolimus, or zartierolimus, the idea here is that this drug will inhibit cell mitosis, and it inhibits cell mitosis at the level of the smooth muscle cell. And the reason why this is important is that when we used bare metal stents in the past, bare metal stents would, would not be coated with drug, and what would happen is that the smooth muscle cell would, would produce a lot of extracellular matrix material and cause scar tissue to form within that stent, and asnosis would redevelop. So that's why drug eluding sets with everlumis, serolumis, and zertilumis are really helpful. But the problem with these drugs is that it impairs the process of endothelialization, the healing process of the coronary vessel.
And so until that process is complete, patients are at increased risk of coronary atherothrombosis. So it's very important in a patient that undergoes a percutaneous coronary intervention with a drug-eluting stent that they be on aspirin as well as clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrelor for a certain period of time. So I went on a little bit of a digression here, if you don't mind, so that you could better understand the use of these medications. Now, another foundation to medical therapy for coronary artery disease, a world called HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, or what are more commonly known as statins, which you learned about in your biochemistry course. You learned about HMG-CoA reductase, which is responsible for the synthesis of cholesterol. So this inhibitor is obviously inhibiting the synthesis of cholesterol, but also stabilizes plaque and improves endothelial function. Endothelial dysfunction can be associated with coronary artery disease, but the adverse effects that we need to be aware of include myalgias and transaminitis. And last but not least is a new class of medications known as PCSK9 inhibitors. PCSK9 stands for Paraprotein convertase subsilicin kexin type 9 inhibitors. And so what happens with PCSK9 is that PCSK9 binds to the LDL receptor. And when it binds the LDL receptor, it commits it to undergo degradation. And so what we want to do is that we want to have more LDL receptors at the level of a patocyte. Why is that important? If we have more LDL receptors at the level of a patocyte, then LDL will bind to it and take it out of the bloodstream so LDL cannot deposit within coronary vessels. So PCSK9 inhibitors block the effect of PCSK9. In fact, these PCSK9 inhibitors are actually injectable monoclonal antibodies that inhibit this PCSK9 enzyme, which degrades the LDL receptor on the liver cell surface. And because it's a monoclonal antibody, there are no adverse effects associated with this medication other than the challenges of injecting it, but that's a pretty easy process. So let's come back to the patient. So the patient is started on aspirin, on, as well as an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor, in this case, a torvastatin. The patient is also started on the beta blocker, referred to as metoprolol tartrate, and it's also started on organic nitrate, in this case, isosorbide mononitrate. So this patient is on very good medical therapy. However, he has Canadian Cardiovascular Society Class 3 angina and this high-risk stress test, as we talked about. We talked about how there was involvement of the mid-left anterior descending artery on his stress test, and there's a large amount of myocardium so tended by this vessel. So prognostically, there could be an advantage if we think about mechanical revascularization, but always we want to think about medical therapy, and that's why the patient was started in medical therapy. So shown here is a table of the different classes of Canadian cardiovascular society classes of angina. We have class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4. I will uh, forego reading through each of the different classes. At your leisure, feel free to review this. This is not something that's heavily emphasize in your course, but I just want you to make you aware of the concept of different classes of angina, uh, which are really important in terms of randomized control trials when we're looking at newer agents. We want to make sure we have inclusion criteria that are pretty appropriate and fair. This patient in particular, Mr. Aggie Davis has class 3 angina, despite being on a whole set of medications that are really appropriate for him, that should have a really dramatic anti-anginal effect. So we might wonder that this patient may have failed medical therapy if he's still having Canadian cardiovascular Society class three angina. So another question in terms of clinical decision-making, what should be done next? So if we're in our live sessions, I would give you more time because your faculty facilitator would be able to, to help you explore the answer to this question in a little bit more detail. In this case, uh, because you're on your own, I want you to take about 30 seconds and think about um, maybe family members, patients you've taken care of, perhaps in your clinic, or other instances or experiences you had about what happened when that individual had coronary artery disease. What did they undergo? So, Mr. Aggie Davis, what should be done next? Let's explore the answer to that question. <laughs>
So forget about exploring it. Let's just say cardiac catheterization. I tease you. So cardiac catheterization. This is a term to refer to a diagnostic coronary angiogram. So this would be a good option in a patient like Mr. Aggie Davis. So he had a stress test that suggested disease in the mid left anterior descending artery. He's very, very appropriately put on anti-anginal therapy as well as medical therapy for stable angina, coronary artery disease, and yet he's still having symptoms. So we have to think about some more aggressive measures because he's starting to, or he's, he seems to have failed medical therapy. It's not a, it hasn't been adequate for him. So he started thinking about doing a coronary angiogram, and that's what happened with Mr. Aggie Davis. So let's review his coronary angiogram together. So over here we have the RAO view. So this is a coronary angiogram that I performed in Mr. Aggie Davis. So I am a what's called radial operator. So I do procedures primarily using the arteries of the wrist. So using that artery in the wrist, we have a catheter that's engaged in the left main coronary artery as shown here. So a catheter engaged in the left main coronary artery and we're injecting dye. And then we're able to create this image with what's called cinefluoroscopy. So this is the left main coronary artery, the tree trunk of the system, left main coronary artery. And this is a left circumflex artery with the obtuse marginal branches coming off. So we have several obtuse marginal branches. So I'll let you hone in and look at that for a second here. So those are obtuse marginal branches coming off of the left circumflex artery. There is some disease here. It may be hard for you to recognize, but there is probably a 50 to 60% stenosis. So if we think about the charts that I showed you previously, a 50-60% stenosis probably is not going to result in chest pain at rest. But what we do notice here is that there should be a vessel coming down. And we don't see that because there's a stenosis here, and we'll see that a little bit better in subsequent views. So let's now pay attention and look at the REO caudal view. So here in the REO caudal view, we have again have that catheter from the arm engaged in the left main coronary artery. We have a circumflex artery. Now here we can see the stenosis and the obtuse marginal branch arising from the left circumflex artery. But here we can better see that there is a actually 100% stenosis in the mid left anterior descending artery where the artery should be coming down and we don't see that. It should be coursing towards the apical wall with diagonal branches coming off it as well as septal perforator branches. So we don't see that because there is an occlusion. I want to make it really clear to you, when I use the term occlusion, that means 100% stenosis. When I use the term occlusion, that means 100% stenosis. If, if the degree of stenosis is less than 100%, then we'll say 90% stenosis, 70% stenosis, etc. So let's move on now and look at some more views in order to better appreciate what is occurring in the left anterior descending artery. So now again, we have that catheter engaged in the left main corner artery, and we see the left anterior descending in the beginning part of it here, and it should be coursing all the way down, and it's not, because again, there's 100% stenosis right here. 100% stenosis right here. This is a septal perforator branch coming off of it, so that's applying the septal wall. And then this is a left circumflex artery that we talked about before. So this is a left circumflex artery and then obtuse marginal branches. That was in the iliocranial view, left anterior oblique, and the areocranial, which is a right anterior oblique, just like on the previous slides. So now again, the left anterior descending artery should be coming down. We don't see it because there's a high grade stenosis. So you should be able to recognize that now in the areocranial view. And this is a circumflex artery supplying the anterior lateral wall. So the question becomes, well, what about the right coronary artery? What does the right coronary artery look like? So we have two views of that. So now we've used the catheter and redirected it into the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve. And the catheter is now engaged in the right coronary artery as shown here. And then we're injecting dye. And so there is some, some disease here in this mid portion of the right coronary artery, but it's not a high grade stenosis. It's probably on the order of 20 to 30 percent in this area in particular. And so the right coronary artery is coursing down. This is our acute marginal branches coming off of it. 
So again, here's one acute marginal branch, here's another acute marginal branch, and you're just applying the right ventricle as we discussed in your first lecture with me. And the right coronary artery is sort of making a C to go down to the inferior wall, and it's going to supply or provide the posterior descending artery, and that's what it's doing here. So this is a posterior descending artery. But what you'll notice here, what's really interesting, is that you'll see the left anterior descending artery being filled by what are called collateral branches. Collateral branches. So the right coronary artery is providing small collateral channels to the left anterior descending artery because otherwise the patient would have 100% stenosis with no flow to the distal portion of the coronary artery. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this course. But because this patient has collaterals, this patient was able to present with stable angina and not a myocardial infarction. If we have a sudden occlusion of a coronary artery, more commonly we'll present with a myocardial infarction. And now here's a right anterior oblique view where we have the right coronary artery again here, and you can see clearly collaterals forming the, through the septal perforators to the left anterior descending artery. And again, I'll show the left anterior descending artery coming down. I don't want to emphasize this too much. We more want you to recognize the fact that we have a high-grade stenosis in the left anterior descending artery, but there are collateral branches coming from the right coronary artery supplying the mid to distal portions of the left anterior descending artery as it is shown here. I'll let you look at that a, a couple more times here. So the big question becomes, now that we define Mr. Aggie Davis's coronary anatomy, now that we know he definitely has this high-grade lesion in the coronary artery, specifically the left anterior descending artery, what should we do next? So we have an option here of mechanical revascularization. And one form of mechanical re revascularization is known as percutaneous coronary intervention. So as an interventional cardiologist here at UC Davis, I perform this procedure on a regular basis, percutaneous coronary intervention. And so what's showing actually in this cartoon here actually is a, a depiction of the left anterior descending artery focusing on the mid left anterior descending artery where we have plaque. So here again, we have plaque as shown in yellow. And so what we need to do here is before we can position a stent, what's not shown in this figure is we've got to get a wire to go across the, the plaque. And that wire then is a rail to position this stent catheter and so we basically have the stent, which is wound up, if you will, around a balloon. And what we're going to do when we go from step one to two, this is step one, to position the stent where we want it. Step two is actually to inflate the balloon so the stent gets implanted into the vessel wall. So it gets implanted into the vessel wall. As an interventional cardiologist, we're very careful to make sure that the stent is appropriately sized to the vessel wall. And that takes a lot of practice and skill to be able to do. And then what happens is the wire is removed and then the balloon catheter stent delivery system is removed. And then that stent stays in the patient for the rest of their life. And if they develop instant restenosis, so plaque buildup within that stent, we put another stent within it. We never remove the stent. That stent is going to be endothelialized. The patient's going to form his tissue, his or her tissue uh, around that stent and it's going to be there for the rest of his life. So what do we specifically do in terms of Mr. Aggie Davis when we come back to him as a patient? Well, I'm going to spare you the complexities of the procedure, but his left anterior descending occlusion requires special skills as an interventional cardiologist to be able to cross. We use a technique called anti-grade wire escalation. Because that artery is completely blocked off and we need to get a wire across it, you can imagine if that blockage has been there for some time, that that plaque can be pretty tough and rough. And we have to be able to get a wire across that plaque that's completely blocked off the artery. So we have to use stiffer and stiffer wires to be able to do that. And so we are finally able to get a wire across the artery. As you see here, you can see the opaque, the, the radio opaque portion of the wire. It's, it's obvious here. And we've gone to that across the blockage, which is up here. So I'll let that play out so you can see that. But more importantly, I want to show you how things look after you position that stent. So you might remember this left anterior cranial view. Now we have flow all the way throughout the artery. And I'll let that play a couple times so you'll be able to see that. So now this patient's 
anterior wall, apex, and to some degree the anterior lateral wall are now supplied by epicardial coronary vessels. And then this is a right anterior oblique cranial view, again showing the left anterior descending artery taking this course where it's coursing towards the apex of the left ventricle. So a very good result for Mr. Aggie Davis where we would not expect him to have any more chest pain from the left anterior descending artery because of the fact that we did perform that we perform percutaneous coronary intervention, a form of mechanical revascularization. Now, I want you to be aware of the fact that we have other options for patients. That option includes coronary artery bypass graft surgery, or cabbage. Cabbage is actually the most common cardiac surgery operation performed worldwide. Cabbage surgery entails grafting portions of a patient's natal blood vessels to bypass obstructed coronary arteries while the patient is put on a coronary pulmonary bypass machine. So here's that cardiopulmonary bypass machine. It's doing the work of the heart and the lungs while surgery is being done. Uh, we won't get, get into the nuances of how that's performed. But what I do want to talk about the, are the two types of bypasses. So two types of bypasses are illustrated here. So we have the left internal mammary artery that's here, the left internal mammary artery that goes by the abbreviation of Lima that normally comes off of the left subclavian artery is shown here. So it originates from it. And so what we're doing here is that the left internal mammary artery actually is going to the chest wall. What the surgeon is doing is that they're rerouting the left internal mammary artery away from the chest wall, so just beyond the blockage. So there's a blockage here in the left anterior descending artery, and they're do bypassing that blockage and sewing the left ventral mammary artery onto the left anterior descending artery. Another option is to use a saphenous vein graft. So we take a saphenous vein graft from the leg and we put it in reverse direction so that the valves that are ligated aren't an issue. We attach it to the aider shown here, and then we attach it beyond the blockage or narrowing as shown here onto the coronary vessel, distal the stenotic segment. And so this would be an example of a two-vessel coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So one thing I'll also mention is that the left internal mammary artery has a great patency rate. It stays open for 20 or 30 years. Part of the reason it is able to stay open as long as it does is that in comparison to coronary vessels, it has a discontinuous internal elastic lamina. That's not the case for coronary arteries. Because as a discontinuous internal elastic lamina, it makes it impossible for atherosclerosis to really develop. It, there, it can't be a disruption of the intimal layer. And the other thing here is that the intimal layer, or excuse me, the, the media layer rather, is relatively thin with multiple elastic laminae. And there's an absence of a significant muscular component. And because there's an absence of a significant muscular component, because there's an absence of a significant muscular component, it's not going to undergo spasm in the same way that coronary arteries would. So I want to say this again. It has a discontinuous eternate elastic lamina and also a relatively thin media with multiple elastic laminae and the absence of a significant muscular component. So I want to be really clear. So this is not something that will be tested, but it's a question that comes up a lot. Why, doc, does the left internal memory artery stay open for 20 or 30 years, but these saphenous vein grafts do not? And that's the biology or vascular biology behind it. Now we're almost done here. You made it this far. Um, I just want to go from evidence to guidelines. So what I mean by that is that um, we have a lot of randomized controlled trials and guideline statements that help us understand when we should think about doing coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So I really want you to pay attention to this slide because it is going to be something you're going to draw upon for your quiz, your midterm, and also your Mr. Stanford case assessment. So I want you to remember that cabbage surgery to improve survival is recommended for patients with significant that means a greater than 50% diameter stones of the left main coronary artery. So if a patient has a left main coronary artery stenosis of 50% or greater, then cabbage surgery should really be considered. 
Nowadays, we are thinking about doing percutaneous coronary intervention, but it's usually a plan B. Cabbage would be the first option. And that comes as a class one recommendation with multiple randomized control trials indicating that is a good option. Now, the other scenario I want you to be aware of where you should think about cabbage surgery is as follows. So cabbage surgery should really be thought of when a patient has a significant stenosis, that means 70% or greater, and three major coronary arteries with or without involvement of the proximal left anterior descending artery. So if you have involvement of three major coronary arteries with or without involvement of the proximal segment of the left anterior descending artery, you should think about cabbage surgery. So that would mean, for example, a patient that had a 90% stenosis in the right coronary artery, a 90% stenosis in the left circumflex artery, and a 90% stenosis in the mid left anterior descending artery. That's where you think about cabbage surgery. The other potential area where you think about cabbage surgery is if you saw a high-grade stenosis, for example, 90% stenosis of the proximal, proximal left anterior descending artery plus one other major coronary artery. So if you saw 90% stenosis in the proximal left anterior descending artery and a right coronary artery. We often, frequent, we often and frequently perform PCI or stent placement in that situation. Um, so that comes with a grain of salt. But I want you to think about the fact that we think about cabbage surgery primarily when patients have multi-vessel coronary artery disease or if they have involvement in the left main coronary artery. On your exam, we'll make it very clear that the patient has a blockage in three major coronary arteries. So it's very obvious that you should think about cabbage surgery or there's involvement in the left main coronary artery. So finally, we get to take home messages. So I hope this is obvious to you. The ECG is an indispensable tool in the management of patients with chest pain that can help to quickly diagnose coronary artery disease. Regulation of coronary blood flow and the balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand not only explain the physiologic basis for myocardial ischemia, but it also helps explain the basis of antianginal therapy. Moving on. Risk factors do not predict the likelihood that a patient's chest pain is due to coronary artery disease. Instead, they are used to help determine the likelihood that an asymptomatic patient will develop coronary artery disease. So that's something that we didn't emphasize in too much detail in your lecture, but it's something that I want you to be aware of. So when a patient before you in clinic has chest pain, risk factors are not going to tell you, well, hey, this chest pain is more likely to represent coronary artery disease. But the way that risk factors help you is that they help you understand the likelihood that an asymptomatic patient will develop coronary artery disease. And last but not least, percutaneous coronary intervention and cabbage surgery are two options to mechanically relieve coronary artery obstruction, which are typically used when patients fail medical therapy in stable angina. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to review this lecture. I'm sorry we were not able to get through this team-based learning session in person. There are certainly challenges with Zoom moving in and out of the meeting. Uh, again, I want you to review this lecture prior to your exams, primarily when we get to the question part, so make sure you can go through it in detail. Uh, last but not least, I want to make sure that you're aware of my website, tinyurl.com slash ucdcards, which provides additional resources that might be helpful to you. Uh, again, uh, thank you for your attention and your time. I hope that you find this uh, to be a very helpful experience going through this team-based learning session in this way.